grants federal governments put on state and local governments without providing the funding. This hearing is being held by a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee. Connecticut Congressman Christopher Shays is the chairman. It's really bad. Uh, that's the brakes. I'm tempted to just move over one. No, it's just the it's just the bad. It's not working there. It's still also longer. Okay. Like to call this hearing to order and to welcome our witnesses and to welcome our guests and to welcome our C-SPAN audience as well. This is a hearing that won't die, despite near mortal assaults from snowstorms, scheduling conflicts, and time changes. This hearing to examine the issue of unfunded mandates in Medicaid is at last convened. We deeply appreciate the patience and cooperation of all our witnesses. Last year, this subcommittee held four hearings on fraud abuse in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Two of those were on the legislative proposals to strengthen anti-fraud activities and protect the integrity of health care spending. We also heard testimony from the Health and Human Services Inspector General, the Health Care Financing Administration, and Department of Justice state officials, scholars, commentators, and many others on the staggering costs of scams, abuses, and mismanagement. Some estimate that fully 15% of all Medicare and Medicaid spending is wasted. Many of us think it is much higher. Today we address another factor driving Medicaid spending to unsustainable levels, unfunded mandates. Over the years when Congress added to the Medicaid entitlement through expanded eligibility or additional covered services, little or no thought was given to the fiscal impact on the states, or in fact even to the federal government. The Bourne Amendment, one effort intended to help states limit Medicaid reimbursements to reasonable costs, has been transformed into an unfunded mandate enforceable in federal court to reimburse providers for the full attributable cost of every Medicaid service. In a draft report prepared pursuant to the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, Public Law 104-4, the Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations identified the Bourne Amendment as a mandate which any state feels, many states feel, handcuffs their ability to constrain the growth of Medicaid spending during times of fiscal crisis. As a result, Medicaid spending, driven by rigid federal rules, relentless commands a greater and greater share of state budgets. At projected growth rates, state me Medicare expenditures between now and the year 2002 will grow from 69 billion to 104 billion, a 50 percent increase. Federal Medicaid spending is projected to double during the same period. No one claims spending on this uncontrollable, at, at this uncontrollable pace can be sustained for very long without crippling fiscal and human consequences. In an effort to regain control of Medicaid spending, both Congress and the administration have proposed to limit the growth of federal expenditures on the program. Now let's be very clear on that point from the outset. Both parties, both political parties, have proposed to limit the growth of federal Medicaid spending, albeit through very different mechanisms and at different rates as well. Before anyone indulges in any politically charged intelligenic theatrics about cuts, I want to be very clear on this issue, that both sides have acknowledged the need to restrain the rate of growth in Medicaid spending. We are not talking cuts, we are talking about restraining the rate of growth. The question then is how, or more specifically, how can federal Medicaid spending be restrained without shifting unbearable costs to the states through unfunded mandates? The Congress proposed to transform Medicaid into a block grant, providing a defined federal grant to the states, along with the responsibility and flexibility to design and purchase health care for those in need. The administration proposed a per capita cap on federal Medicaid spending, limiting the growth of per beneficiary expenditures, but man ma maintaining mandated eligibility and services. We both have different approaches. We will discuss both proposals today, asking our witnesses which approach offers states the most effective, fiscally sustainable opportunity to provide for the health needs of vulnerable citizens. 
The states are already leading the way to Medicaid reform. Minnesota, Connecticut, Tennessee, Arizona, and uh, many other states are pursuing managed care options to control costs and meet expanding needs. But they must do so through a cumbersome waiver process. In the federal state Medicare partnership, it seems only one partner gets to make the rules. To anchor its uh, domineering position, HICFA points out that Medicaid is a voluntary program. But it is a fiction to suppose that a state would withdraw from the program, just as it is fallacious to assume that states would race to the basement in structuring their own health care programs. The Medicaid partnership, like a marriage, must be sustained by mutual respect and trust. The mere possibility of divorce is no justification for federal extortion in the form of unfunded mandates. The president, recently observed, the president recently observed that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good in Medicare and Medicaid reform. I agree with the president, but would go further. State flexibility should not be the enemy of national standards for health care. Managed care should not be perceived as the enemy of quality care and fiscal sustainability should not be seen as the enemy of compassion. No one wants pregnant women and children to go without health care, and they won't. No governor or legislature wants to deny nursing home care to the elderly, and they won't. Yet on our current course, if we don't reform Medicaid, those who want to help the most will surely be hurt the most. Unless we use every tool available to reform Medicaid, including state ingenuity and accountability, the Medicaid partnership will lock both partners in a fiscal death grip. More unfunded Medicaid mandates are not the answer. Having all but used up federal fiscal capacity while amassing $5 trillion of accumulated deficits now debt, we cannot demand the states pick up the tab. I look forward to the testimony of all our witnesses on this important topic and do want to state uh, that we postpone this hearing for Mr. Waxman, who is truly the expert on this issue, uh, has uh, been involved in this for such a long time. He is, uh, as we talk, trying to get a flight down in a foggy day. And um, mindful of the fact that we have two Republicans and no Democrats, uh, I am going to be uh, very uh, uh, cautious of uh, the fact that we don't, in that sense, have uh, someone from the other side of the aisle, and any witness who thinks that we're not being fair on that grounds, speak up, and uh, I'll take pause. Um, Mr. Souter, uh, welcome any comment you'd like to make. Uh, thank you. I don't have an open statement. I'm just one of those shy, retiring freshmen who's here to learn. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing the witnesses today. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, uh, this panel is divided into four, um, we actually have four panels. And uh, I would invite our first panel, the Deputy Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health Services, John Petroborg, and uh, the Director of Medical Administration Policy, Connecticut Department of Social Services, uh, David Parella. I probably didn't do justice to either name. You know, I, uh, if there's any Democrat staffer here, I would more than welcome them to come up uh, if Henry Waxman's staff is here, and uh, I might even uh, uh, invite them to uh, uh, ask questions. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, it's from Dave, you're from the full committee? Yes. Okay, you're more than welcome to, uh, to participate in this hearing. Um, and, um, and ask questions, in fact. So you may sit up here if you would like. <laughs> You don't have to if you don't want, uh, but uh, if, <laughs> see, I do have the advantage. If I don't like his questions, I can. <laughs> no, I, I would find it uh, much more helpful in the hearing to, to make sure we have uh, questions that are asked, and, and I would encourage you to ask questions if you'd like. Um, I, John, why don't we start out with you and uh, uh, welcome your testimony. Uh, excuse me, we are going to swear our witnesses in. That is our practice with all our witnesses, uh, be they the secretary of a department or uh, a guest, or whatever. If you would uh, please uh, both stand. Uh, as is the custom, we swear in our witnesses. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Well. 
For the record, uh, both have responded in the affirmative. That's interesting. But <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, John, why don't you uh, begin your testimony? Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to uh, share with you Minnesota's vision for reforming uh, the Medicaid you know what system. I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to. Your mic is the silver one. C-SPAN is the uh, darker one. I think they pick you up fine. But if you could talk into that silver or chrome mic. All right. Is that better? There? Yeah. And yeah. talk nice and loud, if you will. All right. Um, thanks for this opportunity to discuss Minnesota's vision for reforming the Excuse Medicaid me, I don't think our mic program. is on. We're going to wait a second. No, I, I, yeah, turn it up. It's not. Are All the right. recorders able to, to receive any? Are you picking up any? You can hear us, but you're not picking it up through the. It's on now? Would you is click it on, your, is it click on now? Is that better? Yeah, that is better. All right. Thank you. Okay. Those in the back of the room cannot hear. Uh, we welcome you here. And if you can't hear, raise your hand, and I'll just ask the, our guests to speak louder. All right. Mr. Chairman, thanks uh, for this opportunity to share Minnesota's vision for reforming Medicaid in the context of this hearing on um, unfunded mandates. Um, as uh, the various discussions continue, I want to assure you that Governor Arne Carlson of Minnesota and his administration are working hard to find ways uh, to meet the needs of Minnesotans while supporting the goal of a balanced federal budget. Uh, in Minnesota, we already have a number of market-based reforms underway that show how innovations in health care can work. In fact, in Minnesota, uh, contrary to what some people uh, would have you think, we have shown that managed care is high-quality care. Uh, we've shown that when people don't have to worry about their health insurance, um, they're more likely to get off welfare and to get jobs. And we've shown that saving money doesn't have to come at the expense of our children. Uh, in spite of our successes, we know uh, we have just begun. And that's why uh, Minnesota is wholeheartedly behind efforts here in Washington to create a better publicly funded health care system. Uh, as Congress works to create that new system, we in Minnesota want to make sure that states have the right balance of flexibility and funding to achieve our ultimate goal, access to affordable, quality health care for people in need. Uh, when we talk about this balance between uh, adequate funding and flexibility, it is also critical uh, that uh, any mandates uh, that come out of Washington receive uh, proper funding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. First, the case for retiring Medicaid. Uh, um, tinkering with the current Medicaid system will provide, uh, we believe, neither the uh, broad flexibility needed nor funding that can sustain um, our goal of meeting the needs to care for our citizens. Medicaid has been altered in large and small ways for many years, and the result is a system that's difficult to administer. Even experts uh, find it difficult to understand the, the nuances of the system. A marvel in its day, Medicaid uh, is now a system that's collapsing under its own weight. Uh, the rate of growth in the Medicaid program exceeds the rate of growth in pers of personal income in our state. Uh, in Minnesota and many other parts of the country, the state share of the current Medicaid program will soon consume a majority of the state's general fund budget. Uh, this is a path that is simply not acceptable. And another round of incremental change is not enough to turn the situation around. Uh, if we try that course, we believe that the people we're trying to serve and protect will be hurt. There simply will not be enough money available to support Medicaid as we know it, and we will have to uh, make cuts in the program at the expense of some of our most vulnerable citizens. So it, in Minnesota, we believe we need to start fresh. <coughs> um, and to do that, uh, we need a system that allows us to be true to our values and allows us to create efficient, simple, and people-centered approaches. Uh, in Minnesota, um, as we uh, have uh, participated in the national debate, the Governor uh, Carlson's administration has gone to great lengths to try to uh, secure public input into uh, the nature and the, and the direction of our publicly funded health care programs. We've traveled around the state this summer and fall and found people very open uh, to change. Uh, for the record, I've included a document that outlines Minnesota's plan and which grew out of this broad-based uh, input. The plan would create a new health care system built on a number of guiding principles. First, providing access to quality, high quality care, promoting personal independence and wellness, and ensuring efficiency and value, and reinforcing accountability and responsibility. 
For Minnesotans who are elderly or disabled, we are trying different ways of coordinating care to stress independence and quality of life. Uh, ways that would uh, focus our purchasing towards buying comprehensive packages of services, um, providing an incentive to find appropriate care in the appropriate place. Current Medicaid program has a strong uh, residential bias, if you will. Uh, this is all not only fiscally prudent, but it is what our people want and need. Uh, but when we talk about flexibility, this does not mean putting consumers at risk. In fact, uh, in Minnesota, consumer protection and education must be at the core of any redesigned program. We believe that the new system has the potential for greater consumer protection than does the current system, which is based on complex, highly prescriptive regulations and regulatory <coughs> enforcement mechanisms. Using market-based strategies to maximize the state's tremendous purchasing power, we believe we'll have the option of demanding higher standards. As for marginal providers that are protected by the current system, they will either improve or we will take our business elsewhere. We must also develop mechanisms for healthcare consumers to have a voice, mechanisms that focus on outcomes, not rules and regulations, and mechanisms that are available to all healthcare consumers, not just special procedures for public clients only. Options include consumer satisfaction surveys, um, which we are already trying in our state. We've recently completed a uh, quite uh, a comprehensive uh, survey of Minnesotans about their health care and published the results in newspapers around the state. Um, Minnesota's publicly funded programs uh, scored very well in this, in this um, survey. In fact, the state subsidized program for low-income working uh, families, Minnesota Care, um, scored number one of all public and private uh, health care plans in the state. Because of Minnesota's tremendous health care infrastructure, we believe that within a new system we also must address the need for uh, education and research, which are now indirectly funded through the Medicaid program. Given the expected cuts in uh, our ch uh, uh, changes in Medicare for medical education and the impact of an increasingly competitive market, uh, the governor has become concerned about the erosion of this uh, resource in our state. Um, let me address the issue of caring for the needy and the issue of an entitlement briefly. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, concerning this uh, issue. The absence of Medicaid does not have to mean the end of our commitment to providing a safety net for certain populations. We believe a safety net must be maintained, but that it should and can exist in the context of a new system. We do not need to preserve the Met Medicaid to guarantee access to health care for our citizens. Finally, let me... Um, say that we've in Minnesota uh, set out a very ambitious agenda, one that we're eagerly taking on in Minnesota, and we believe we can be successful if we have the kind of flexibility that, that has been discussed here in Washington and adequate funding to do that. It, this will also take time. It's taken nearly 30 years to build the existing Medicaid program, and we need to have sufficient transition time to implement this new system and minimize disruption to the people that need services. Finally, I think that there are uh, several areas where there is a lot of agreement in spite of the, uh, the, uh, the, d the discussion here. Most of us believe that eligibility should be simpler, that our focus should be on people, not on programs, and that market forces should be used to the fullest extent possible, and that people shouldn't have to quit their jobs to get health care for the children. So if we step back from the debate and focus on, on some of the things that we agree on, I think that we have the basis for uh, further work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, David Parella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is David Parella. I'm the director for medical policy for the Connecticut Department of Social Services. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today about the regulatory issues we have struggled with in Connecticut as we attempt to reform our Medicaid program. They are not unique to Connecticut but they are illustrative of the issues the states are facing as we attempt to achieve the goals of improved access and long-term cost containment within the current Medicaid regulatory environment. I'd like to focus today on managed care and provider reimbursement. In the interest of time, 
I'd refer you to my written testimony for a discussion of our ongoing problems with recipient cost sharing and the financing of health care for the uninsured. Suffice it to say that my description of our travails with regulations and mandates are part of a plea for greater flexibility for the states to address issues related to the financing of health care for the poor. Simply stated, if you are to restrain the rate of growth and federal spending on the program, you must give us the flexibility to operate programs that incorporate the innovations which are commonplace in the private sector. In Connecticut, we currently serve over 300,000 recipients, one out of every 10 citizens in the state. Our benefit package is a generous one, including 27 of the 33 optional services in our state plan. The rates we pay for services are among the highest in the country. The, pr the pressure to maintain these rates of payment is certainly related to the high cost of goods and services in the Northeast. But even greater pressure is applied by the force of federal regulations. The Bourne Amendment and other requirements in the Social Security Act, which mandate cost-based reimbursement, have contributed to higher costs for a small percentage of our total recipient population. As we have continued to expand coverage for poor families, these same families are left with a smaller pool of total Medicaid spending. In contrast, in fiscal year, federal fiscal year 1994, the elderly and the disabled, the main consumers of institutional services, accounted for 82% of spending in the Connecticut Medicaid program, while representing only 27% of the total eligible population. This burden represents a serious impediment to further reforms in a Medicaid program where the state share of expenditures will account for 15% of the state general fund in the 1996 state fiscal year. Into this context came a Bourne Amendment lawsuit filed by the Connecticut Hospital Association. The suit challenged the state's application of the methodologies set forth in the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, known as TEFRA for the calculation of inpatient rates. After months of negotiations involving the state, the hospitals, and the federal government over claims for an additional $350 million, an agreement was reached to settle the case at a cost of $34.6 million, subject to ratification by the state legislature. It is the taxpayer who will pay the programmatic and administrative costs to settle this dispute. The resolution of our Bourne experience was related indirectly to my second subject, the implementation of managed care for our AFDC population. By 1993, Connecticut had recognized that the cost of providing services was slowly eroding our ability to maintain our benefit structure for a population of children and families that had grown rapidly with the impact of the recession and legislative initiatives to expand coverage. We were one of the last of the high-cost, high-benefit states to move aggressively to managed care. We submitted our waiver application in January of 1995. We were ably assisted by our HICFA regional office staff during the three months that went, went by before we received our first official response, 12 pages of detailed questions. When first elected, President Clinton had committed HICFA to a single round of questions as part of the waiver review process. However, having responded to our regional office in May, we received another set of requests for clarification from the central office the following month. Having finally convinced the central office of the merits of the plan, we still had to negotiate with the Office of Management and Budget, despite the fact that similar 1915B freedom of choice waivers had previously been approved in over 40 states. All these questions and negotiations diverted energy from the real-world considerations of delivering health care. The process has been a bonanza for consultants, but with little tangible benefit for the recipients whose entitlement the laws are designed to protect. I mentioned at the outset that our managed care initiative was related indirectly to the resolution of Boren. Over the past five years, enrollment in HMOs in Connecticut has grown rapidly. Hospitals with excess capacity find themselves in an increasingly competitive environment, forced to grant discounts which are nearly as deep as the Medicaid rates which were in dispute. With the national debate turning to consideration of block grants to replace Medicaid, providers began to feel a certain nostalgia for the good old days of cost-based Medicaid reimbursement. As we concluded negotiations on the Boren settlement, a key provision was that the state would promise
to retain, not repeal, the current rate methodology for a minimum of 18 months until such time as a major restructuring of federal aid would require the state to revise it. The irony of the outcome should be lost on no one. From the snowbound vantage point of a small New England state, it appears that the chief stumbling block to concluding an agreement that would redefine Medicaid is the concept of entitlement. I believe it's not the guarantee of coverage that frightens the states. Rather, it is the mandated benefits for recipients and providers alike, the limit on state discretion to manage those benefits, and the federal cause of action that stand in the way of an agreement. If the states and the federal government are to move to become prudent purchasers of health care, they must stop tying each other's hands in mandating the structure of the system to provide that care. Flexibility on amount, scope, duration, and comparability of benefits will go a long way toward relieving state concerns about covered populations. Despite our initial concerns about the funding formula, we now believe that there was enough money in the Balanced Budget Act of 1995 passed by Congress and vetoed by the President to do the job given added flexibility. In contrast, the President's own proposal would have cost our state $450 million over the seven-year period from 1996 to 2002 with little or none of the flexibility we need to manage more efficiently. It is clearly an unfunded mandate for the states. I wish the budget negotiators here in Washington success in their efforts. Our state and the future of the Medicaid program can ill afford either the continuation of the current impasse or the status quo. Thank you. I thank both gentlemen and uh, I'd like to ask a few questions and then uh, Mr. Souter and would welcome um, counsel as well to, to ask if you like. Um, I need to have a sense to start with about um, what does the federal government do specifically, and maybe specifically HICFA, that causes you the most difficulty? Um, and I'd take either of you to answer it. Let me, let me preface my statement by saying this is, this is basically the summary, the Medicaid source book, that describes what states have to do. It obviously contains data as well. The print is small. Uh, but this is, this is kind of your Bible. You've got to follow it. And we want to candidly kind of throw this in the trash can and, and have a document that would be much smaller that would give you the flexibility. Now, the danger when you do that is you may do some things we don't like. Uh, and so what the federal government is having to you know, deal with is what is that? It, it, can there be a balance? Should we, you know, exactly how we want to, how should we move? Our interest as the, the majority is to get rid of this book. Now, uh, what would be helpful is for you to describe, if you can, some ways that you find it difficult to comply that, that needlessly ratchet up costs. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I believe that uh, really um, one has to look at the whole. Um, the whole is 30 years of, of um, additions to a, to a basic concept that has, has uh, become more and more uh, prescriptive and, and, and regulated. Areas of mandated eligibility coverage and, and, and multiple groups of coverage is, is, is a serious uh, problem. When you say that, I want you to speak a little more specifically. You mean... We, we estimate in Minnesota, uh, well, actually, our Medicaid in, uh, program in Minnesota has 60 different doorways. 60 different, 60 different ways, what? Doorways, we, dis we say. 60 okay. different ways you can qualify or must qualify in order to, to become eligible for the Medicaid program. Uh, we'd like to look at income as, as the principal. Um, determinant of whether or not someone should be eligible rather than whether or not there's this combination of family members with these circumstances. Um, that's, a, that's a very uh, a direct uh, uh, example of the kind of complexity. I mean, one obvious doorway is if you're poor and have a child and you're on AFDC, right. uh, you get health care costs. Right. Now, that's nothing you would dispute, correct? That's, that's, correct. Okay. that's correct. If you're 65 and older, and your income uh, is uh, basically non-existent, uh, you get nursing care. Now, uh, that's said in more general terms. Does the federal government begin to outline what kind of nursing care, uh, or is that mostly state regulation? 
uh, Mr. Chairman, um, then, then we get into the area of, of actual, the kind of services that are okay. required. So, so the first issue is who qualifies. Who qualifies. And, and now, would Connecticut, um, uh, Mr. Perella, see the, the same doorway of 60 doors, or is it more or less? Or, I mean, well, in Connecticut, we don't have 60 doors. We have 41 doors. Okay. But <laughs> it's still a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different ways to slice what is basically the same population of people that are, are low income. And uh, having the groups added on with very incremental differences in terms of how income or assets are treated or um, composition of the household, number of children, all of those things can cause you to move into another coverage group, which requires the state to report separately on that group on its expenditures. It's a, it's a tremendously complex, I would say overly complex, mm -hmm. way of administering the program and, and certainly adds to the administrative costs of, uh, of maintaining coverage. I would second everything that John had said that uh, in Connecticut, we as well are looking towards moving towards a more means-tested, straight, income-tested type of model for assistance where we could cast the net over largely the same population without slicing it up so finely that we have to move between so many coverage groups in order to maintain uh, the entitlement. I think that's certainly part of it. The other side to it, as I alluded to in my remarks, is on the, the, the mandates as far as coverage and, uh, and, and service delivery of benefits. It's very difficult in the current Medicaid program, uh, uh, moving to managed care or even within managed care, if you want to move to a system where you design benefit packages specifically for certain populations. We've done it. Minnesota has done it. Well, you, we, Connecticut's just started, correct? That's correct, but we've, we've moved away from comparability of services under our home and community-based services waivers for many years now. Going back to 87, we have an expanded home and community-based service program for the elderly, um, largely intended to keep those people from having to make a choice going into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. um, but the current process does require um, somewhat burdensome, um, uh, waiver application and submission in order to structure your benefit package specifically to meet the needs of that one of those 41 coverage groups. Now, uh, Medicaid basically is health care for the poor and nursing care for the elderly. I mean, I view it that way. Is that an improper way to view it? Uh, I think of it pretty much on those terms. There are three main groups. There are families that are covered, poor families, the disabled, and the elderly. Right. Now, um, with the disability group that I should also add, the, the charge is that basically block granting to the states means that potentially we're pitting the old against the young, um, the healthy maybe against the unhealthy, and so on, which is an interesting concept because b bottom line, as a member of Congress, I have to make those decisions every day. I have to decide whether more resources go to the elderly or more go to, to, the, to, to, to the younger incomes. I have come to a basic conclusion that when I look at Medicaid, as an average, 70% of the resources go to 30% of the individuals, the elderly, and 30% of the, of the resources go to 70%, which are, the, which are the poor, basically, and the disabled. Now, the question mark, um, uh, and it, it may be, um, I noticed a shaking of the head in the back, and unfortunately you're not testifying here, but um, it, it is the, let's put out the disabled, but bottom line on the, on the, on the poor versus the elderly, um, we have to make choices and you all have to make choices. The big concern that some have, like in the state of Connecticut, is that the <coughs> lobby group for the elderly in nursing homes will gobble up the resources that are going to the poor. Um, bottom line, how, how would a state deal with that issue? Well, I think there's a, a couple of answers to that. Um, I think it, that's exactly um, uh, a main concern. Um, and that, that, that exists in Connecticut today. Even with the current Medicaid structure, there's still competition for dollars in terms of where the state is looking for expansions. Um, I think that the uh, Medigrant legislation that was passed did contain provisions for um, set-asides, mandated set-asides, certain percentage of the money based on um, prior history would have to continue to be spent on families, on disabled, on, on elderly, based, and which would provide some insulation 
for, I think, the situation that you're, you're alluding to, where suddenly there would be a tremendous lobbying pressure to move large chunks of those resources away from one of the other population groups and into, into, into the other two. Since, since there are only two witnesses, Ms. Sauter, I'm just going to take a little bit more time and then, then we'll, we'll get to you. Um, uh, excuse me, since there are only two of us uh, plus counsel uh, here to ask questions, we don't have to follow the five-minute rule as exact. Um, what I, I want to kind of hone in on this issue. Ultimately, the objective is to enable you to save money. Now, in my mind, saving money doesn't mean denying services. It means, in my mind, uh, providing better service. Um, and in my mind, we are not able to provide the quality service because we have what I think is an archaic system that doesn't provide flexibility. Could you, either of you illustrate how you can provide better service at less cost? Um, Mr. Chairman, in fact, I think that's one of the, uh, the uh, dangers of incremental change in this area is, is that we would, we, we, the ability to craft innovative new solutions to make those dollars go further uh, would, would be hampered. Minnesota's goal really is one of trying to protect access in terms of the number of people covered. Mm -hmm. Uh, but to do that in, 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 in two ways. One, in, in, in the sense of designing benefit packages that are more like mm -hmm. um, employee-based uh, benefit packages that are now uh, available to state of Minnesota employees or, or, or 3M employees uh, in the state. Um, the other is to look for um, more efficient ways to purchase services for the elderly and disabled, to purchase those services in comprehensive packages of service rather than in discrete um, uh, little, little pieces. For example, in Minnesota, nursing home care is, is funded directly uh, by, by, by the state. Uh, we're looking at, um, uh, through the Medicaid program, hospital services for that population are funded through the Medicare program, and in-home services or at-home services are, are essentially a state-funded service, although we have some uh, wavered services there as well. We would like to look at purchasing health care services for that population, all of those services, in a single package with a single price so that the incentive is to find the most appropriate level of care for that person, not uh, encourage that person to go into the Medicare, Medicaid system uh, in order to get covered uh, services at the nursing home. I, I would second that. I think one of the things that John was alluding to is that one of the things that contributes to higher costs, uh, both for the states and for the federal government, is this kind of uh, Alphonse and Gaston Act between Medicaid and Medicare, where Medicare uh, has limited exposure on the nursing home side, but Medicaid picks up the full brunt. Medicaid has limited exposure on the hospital side, but Medicare picks up the brunt. Yeah. So this, the two programs are sort of involved in this dance where patients are sort of discharged from one f level of care to another. Um, it doesn't necessarily serve the, the interests of the patient in any particular way, um, nor does it lead to terrific uh, coordination of the benefits, really. I mean, because both programs have somewhat different incentives right now, financially. And the same is true between those residentially based programs, nursing home and hospitals, and in-home services. And, and again, the dance between those, those two uh, programs. So if we can purchase a service um, that is, is defined around a health care outcome that includes that whole range of services, That's right. we believe that the system will move towards finding the most appropriate care for the person at the best price. Okay. Mr. Sauter, I welcome your questions. And I'm going to come back and ask you some more. And uh, Mr. Vladek, we're going to have you on exactly at 1 o'clock. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. First for both of you, is the growth rate, you've kind of alluded to this, but is the inflation rate in Medicare not, not the uh, number of people going into the system, but the inflation per recipient or cost per recipient going up at a faster rate than it is in the private sector? I presume that's somewhat what you're saying and why you want to go. Uh, approximately, do you know what that rate is in Medicare? We've heard 10 versus 2. Okay, well, in Connecticut, if you average our rate of increase overall on the program for the years from 1991 to 1996, we averaged in excess of 10%. Over the last couple of years, as the managed care has started to come in and some of the other cost containment measures, that rate's dropping, dropping rapidly. It's, we've pretty much cut that in half, but it's still probably running between 
five and six percent per year. I'm not sure what the and that's not counting the growth in the population. That's the no, that's just the cost per case. There were some years where we were topping out over fifteen percent per year. Uh, it's it's depending on in the impact of legislation that would be coming down. You'd see a one a short term increase. Yeah, uh, in Minnesota, we would would have seen a similar experience. Our our um, growth rate for acute care for families and children has been has been pretty moderate, and as have health care costs in general in Minnesota for that population. Where the growth has occurred is in services for the disabled and for the elderly, where the provisions of the Bourne Amendment have restricted our ability to to control that cost growth. As we've uh, battled through some of the arguments here. Uh, We've had some internal tension between the more rural uh, states and some of the urban states. And as you look at these alternative managed care and HMO type systems and so on, um, it's one thing in southern Minnesota where you have Mayo Clinic and other fairly widespread system. What is it like in the northern parts of the state where it's much more spread out and the population is more spread out? Are there alternatives there that would exist? Um, there are, and uh, there will need to be developed more. Um, as, as we move to expand our managed care strategy across the whole state, we are having to find different, different strategies. I mean, this is part of the uh, why we need some transition time here, is to work out those kinds of concerns in the various parts of the state. But even in nor northwestern Minnesota, for example, uh, managed care is, is, is impacting that marketplace with um, with uh, services out of some of the population centers that are nearby, uh, Fargo and, and, and Grand Forks, for example. So um, it, is a, it is an approach that we believe can work, um, but has to take account of the infrastructure in those various parts of the state. Are the, um, part of our concern was is at the threshold of reimbursement, because when you look at the cost for uh, non-seniors, uh, uh, and non-acute care is substantially different than it is for others because there may not be enough of them to get to a threshold. And if our reimbursement rate isn't high enough, you may not have enough people with which to get the facilities that you need. Have you seen that? And uh, do you have different type of reimbursement rate problems in those areas? Um, that, that is an issue that, um, again, I think is part of the transition process. Uh, we're, we're struggling with that particularly around dental services in, in the rural part, parts of our state. So I, I, I certainly, uh, you know, that is a legitimate issue. We, we heard a couple of different numbers, but Mr. Prell, I think you said 80, 82 percent were elderly and disabled. Does that mean only 18 percent is going to the That's correct. Uh, lower income families? Is that similar to Minnesota or how is um, in, in terms of the, the, the expenditures or the case? Though? Yeah. I understood that was expenditures. The expenditures, that is expenditures. Yeah. So it's up near eight, over 80 percent now for elderly and disabled as I think it's more like 75, uh, 30 in, uh, 75, 25 in Minnesota. If it's 75, 25, one of the uh, comments uh, I'm interested in this is it, I assume then you're just relating to the 25 where you say that the ability to get uh, health care uh, helps people's willingness to move into the job se uh, sector, um, but most of the money is not going to that area at this point. Yeah. Um, Minnesota does operate a state-subsidized health care insurance program for those people just above the Medicaid program. Um, and we have, um, since that program began a year and a half, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, been able to document a direct connection between our AFDC caseload and the use of the Minnesota CARE program. And in fact, we have uh, uh, seen that we have around 4,000 fewer families a month using AFDC in Minnesota at a savings to the state and federal government of $2 million a month uh, from this, the availability of this subsidized health insurance program. Another uh, uh, question that was raised by your uh, testimony, is it Petra or Petra? Borg? Petra Borg. Petra. Um, it, that you said that if you didn't like some of what the uh, organizations were providing, you would like the flexibility to go to alternatives. And one of the problems that we see, uh, particularly in seniors and in Medicaid, and, and um, uh, some of this is from personal example, uh, growing up our church used to visit some uh, nursing homes and you could see where often the Medicaid or the poorest people were, and often they were getting cited, they had, diff uh, they had uh, uh, not very good conditions 
conditions for many people there. We also uh, just went through this with my late father-in-law as we were looking at different nursing homes and considering alternatives. You could see you, very clearly where there was a lot of Medicaid and where there wasn't. We've had a problem in Fort Wayne with a health center uh, that the government would like to close down, but they don't know what to do with the people if they close it down. We heard in the Medicaid, uh, Medicare fraud hearings about, uh, for example, one company that was providing services that was uh, disciplined by the government. They really couldn't cut them off because they didn't know what to do with the people. Are there really alternatives if, if you had some people who you, some major providers to the uh, frail elderly and low-income elderly, uh, where would you go for alternatives? Do they really, in fact, exist? Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, in, in Minnesota, we have uh, we do not have a, a separate um, standard for for Medicaid recipients as for for private pay um, uh, recipients of nursing homes. So our our first defense line of defense. May, it, I, may I ask a question about that? I don't think it's so much that there's a different set of standards, but that when you have higher paying people, no, we have they tend to subsidize we, right. the others. We have the same payment rate for both. So private pay and Medicaid pay the same amount in Minnesota. So there's no difference in payment. Um, and I think that that does, goes a long way to assuring no difference in care. Can I ask you one other question about that? Does that mean if somebody wanted a better place, they can't pay more? Because we start, we've started to see nursing homes that offer a lot more facilities uh, so if it's, are you saying that it's capped and an individual can't pay more? Um, they can find a, uh, find a different nursing home that, that offers more services. In that nursing home, however, the Medicaid oh, patients it, and the private and, and what patients. And I, I was not saying it was different within the nursing home. What I was mm -hmm. saying is there was a tiering of nursing homes hmm. that the lowest income were having a different quality, which, which is not, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying that then what happened was is that you get a group of nursing homes that are used to providing to that group predominantly and is there enough money in that really that there are alternatives? Right. I, I guess the, the ultimate um, answer to that is that the current system is not preventing that. Okay, so Great. let's start with that assumption. Right. And then let's look at whether or not um, some use of the purchasing power of, of the state can, can be useful in defining a higher quality or a higher standard uh, in terms of what uh, the kind of care we want to purchase for those, those individuals. Uh, in Minnesota, we have more nursing homes than we need um, and we would be able to um, start shaping or, or pointing our, our purchasing then towards those, those nursing homes that met our standards. Um, I think that that would be basically our strategy. Uh, I know it's a difficult question. The reason I'm asking it is because bo on both sides of the aisle, we're, you know, those are difficult right. uh, questions. Right. Mr. Prella, too, um, how um, in the home health care area, as we looked at some of... Uh, uh, Medicare, one of the problem is, is it's easier to audit when people are together and that, that while all of us see the advantages of home-based delivery systems and the mm -hmm. saving to the system, mm -hmm. does it not in fact endanger more fraud and ability and, and or auditing costs in that and how are you dealing with that? Have you seen any of that? I guess by your question what you're saying is that it's easier to audit a, a large residential facility where you have people concentrated as opposed to a, a more dispersed delivery model where people are in the home. I think that's sort of the sense of what you're getting at. Right. Um, our audit efforts as far as uh, both home health and nursing homes are, are pretty aggressive. Uh, we have conducted some significant audits of uh, home health delivery um, systems within the state. Uh, it is true that um, on-site audit of the delivery of services is more complicated um, when you're dealing with the dispersed delivery model. But there certainly are central repositories of records that you can go to for verification of service delivery. I wouldn't say that it's less, it is probably more challenging, but it can be done. I'd like to ask one other question yet, if I may. This is, this is a, a hard question that nobody really likes to ask. And by asking this, I don't mean it that I don't prefer home-based delivery systems. In looking at, at children's pro programs, for example, in uh, uh, the programs that try to, family preservation programs, mm -hmm. if somebody's uh, about to be assigned to foster care yeah. in the state, uh, goes and says, let's try to work with that family and try to avoid it. It can save the state tons of money by avoiding the foster care placement. But if you don't have that criteria that they were definitely going into foster care, 
you wind up helping a lot of families who otherwise wouldn't have gone into foster care, and in fact, you don't save that amount of money. Would not some of this problem also be true of health, home health care? That many, do, you, do they have to have already said they're going to a nursing home? Or would not, in fact, many people who would, and for example, in our case with, with my mom and my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. Uh, they have some resources. We, they desire to stay in their homes, and as long as we don't have uh, options, we'll work to keep them in their home. But you give us a home health care option, we may tap into government programs that we wouldn't have otherwise tapped into. How do you do t that type of balance? Well, in our uh, home health, our waiver programs, the, the individual has to meet the medical level of care determination to be placed in a nursing facility. In addition, we do require them to actually file an application uh, for admission to a nursing facility in order to be admitted to the home care waiver program. I think maybe where your question is going is would that provide incentive to individuals who might otherwise elect to continue to care for their family member uh, w and never would have explored the option of going to a nursing facility to indeed file that application because it would right. entitle them to the waiver services. Um, I think under the current system, that's an open question. I think that as you move towards more of a integrated delivery model where you're looking at um, a system that doesn't give the incentive one way or another, financially, whether the person is at home or in the nursing facility, some of that problem is alleviated. I don't know, John, right. whether you would agree well, with I, that. I think that that's, that is a, the, the, the method that we would use, and we need to do it in a way that, that takes advantage of and doesn't discourage that kind of personal and family responsibility. Uh, if I can take one more. At my, in my generation, one of the biggest uh, things, and I, this is another politically explosive question, and that's the drain down of resources. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, it's very tempting, uh, as your parents have saved whatever they uh, can, uh, and they want to pass it to their children to uh, empty out and say, okay, state, take over. Do you see much of that in the uh, Medicaid area along the margins, and is that going to be a growing problem? or? It, it's a very hot political issue in, in, in Minnesota and something I think that is of grave concern. The Minnesota Medicaid program has become um, the long-term care insurance program for the vast majority of our state. And so there are serious discussions in our legislature about different ways of either um, uh, limiting uh, asset transfers uh, in, in, in different ways um, or, or finding ways to make asset transfer not um, necessary in terms of encouraging long-term care insurance um, models that can be purchased earlier. Uh, but uh, again, these are, these are things that take time and, and, and almost a generational uh, shift in, in attitudes, um, but we need to start. I think that uh, it's really difficult to quantify the extent to which the asset transfer issue is contributing cost to your state because you only know the ones that you find out about as you're doing your investigations during the, uh, the penalty period. And there certainly are other asset transfers that occur that the state is unable to detect. Um, one of the strategies that we've um, pursued in Connecticut, and then John had mentioned it, is the long-term care insurance model, uh, where we will uh, grant asset protection when a person applies for Medicaid equal to the dollar value of uh, benefits that they receive from a privately purchased uh, long-term care insurance policy. The idea there being that people would have an incentive to invest in themselves uh, to uh, acquire protection against catastrophic costs in a nursing facility without necessarily just going to the option of saying, well, the state will pick it up. I think that there are innovations like that that can be looked at in ways that would encourage other sectors, including the private sector, to, to, to play more of a role as a payer in nursing facility care. Um, it, it met, one of the, if I may, one of the things that's peculiar about Medicaid's role with nursing facility care is that it's probably the only place, at least in our state, where we're the majority payer. We are paying maybe 10 to 15 percent of the inpatient hospital costs, probably smaller fraction of physician bills paid in the state. But on the nursing facility side, we're probably 62, 65 percent of the market. I mean, we are the big deal as far as nursing facility is concerned. Um, so it's certainly in our interest, if through other mechanisms that we can create, if we can have other incentives for other payers to become involved in that market. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The council is, uh, knows that he can uh, ask questions and chooses not to at this round here, but um, let me be more precise given the shaking of the head in the back in terms of my one-third, two-third an, um, analysis. According to the Kaiser um, uh, Commission on the Future of Medicaid, uh, of the total beneficiaries, 50 percent are children, and they consume 15 percent of the, of the expenditure. And adults, mostly associated with AFDC and pregnancy and so on, are 23 percent of the beneficiaries. They consume 12 percent. If I take the children and the adults, I'm at 73% um, consuming about 27%. Uh, the blind and disabled, and this is where I was off, are 15% of the population consuming 31% of the expenditure. And the elderly are 12% consuming 28%. So to be, and then the, for those who are adding the percentages, the dish or disproportionate share is the 14% not associated with anyone, so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better having <laughs> being more precise. Um, let me, uh, in, the, in like two minutes, gentlemen, is there anything that we can learn uh, from the growth in uh, future Medicaid funding uh, by looking at the recent cross growth in the private sector? Private sector uh, appears to be growing at a lesser rate than the public sector. Um, is, that, is that a significant uh, factor in terms of your calculations? Well, I would say that in our state, um, private sector purchasers of insurance are, are abandoning to a large extent fee-for-service reimbursement models uh, for the major corporations that are based in our state. They are overwhelmingly going to uh, managed care delivery models as a way of trying to contain costs. And I think that the leverage that they're seeking is the same leverage that John alluded to in his remarks about purchasing power for the state. Um, and they're able to do that. Um, I think one of the things that was surprising to us was that historically our rates have been extremely low compared to rates that are paid for similar services in the private sector. But as the private sector has aggressively pursued discounts on rates for medical services as part of the purchase of consortiums of care, they're getting down to a range where they're paying rates which are not all that dissimilar in some instances from what we had been paying in a fee-for-service environment, um, which is one of the things that leads us to think that w we could do better as a purchaser than where we have been historically. I would only add to that the example I think most of us are familiar with having to do with hospital utilization over the last, over the last few years and kind of the way, the way purchasing has, has moved towards shorter stays and and, and services outside of that hospital. If we can apply that same kind of uh, perspective to the way we purchase services for, for nursing care, nursing home care, and services to the uh, disabled, I believe we have a lot of room for, for um, maintaining service uh, and controlling costs. Thank you, John uh, Petroborg and uh, David Perella. I thank you both for coming. Uh, it's a nice way to introduce this issue to the committee. And thank you very much for coming. And, uh, uh, I would um, appreciate your, your testimony and now would invite David, uh, Dr. Bruce Vladek, uh, who is the Administrator of the Healthcare Financing Administration. Mr. Vladek uh, kindly um, uh, allowed us to, uh, Mr. Vladek, I'm going to have you stand up just because I'm going to swear you in a second. Um, well, let me just swear you in then I'll do it. <laughs> Raising your right hand, please. <laughs> so we both can sit down. So we can both sit down. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Vladek, for um, adjusting your schedule. Henry Waxman, as I said earlier, for those of you who may have come in later, has uh, asked us to postpone this hearing slightly. Uh, he was in New York and uh, is uh, being somewhat contained by the fog. And uh, frankly, this hearing would be more interesting uh, if he were here because he is very knowledgeable and I would appreciate hearing his questions as well. Uh, and I've said for the record, I recognize that uh, we really are represented by one side of the aisle up here and uh, want to be thoughtful of that in our questions. But we do want to have a, 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 a meaningful dialogue and that would be helpful. And uh, I know you to be a very uh, devoted public servant and I appreciate you being here and, uh, and welcome your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and all of the um, flexibilities about schedules that were associated with it. And 
in light of where we are in this debate and the, the nature of the subject, and I know your uh, concerns about uh, dialogue, I'm going to I try to keep my um, prepared statement very brief and to um, organize it essentially around uh, three charts, copies of which we're trying to get up here, but which um, I believe are also in the uh, back of your full um, uh, written statements. Um, Medicaid is um, in the process of becoming, um, in one sense, the largest uh, health insurance program um, in the United States of America, now covering 36 million uh, vulnerable Americans uh, through partnership between the federal government and the states. Within the current program structure, states have substantial flexibility to design their programs to meet their unique needs, and the state and federal government have been working to implement more flexibility. We have used our current waiver authority to enable states to pursue innovative approaches to the provision of health care coverage to special populations and to the redesign of delivery systems. Further, as you know, the President has proposed a set of new reforms to provide <laughs> states with still further flexibility while maintaining coverage of vulnerable populations, increasing control of Medicaid costs, and contributing savings to the federal budget. Um, Mr. Chairman, one of the issues that came up with the uh, prior panel had to do with the rate of growth in Medicaid expenditures on a per-enrollee basis. Um, and the chart that's on your right, again, it's Table 1, I believe, or Chart 1 in your um, uh, written uh, material, shows that uh, except for one uh, particular glitch uh, in the period between 1988 um, and 1991, Medicaid uh, rates per beneficiary have traditionally, over the life of the program, grown at a rate uh, lower than or roughly equivalent to the rates uh, per individual um, of uh, private health insurance costs, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, um, as was also noted and as we'll get to, um, a large share of Medicaid expenditures are devoted to uh, folks who are inherently more expensive to care for than are folks uh, covered by private health insurance. Um, that's why there is such a disproportion uh, between the share of the uh, covered um, individuals in Medicaid who are elderly or disabled and the proportion of expenses um, associated um, with um, the elderly and disabled. Um, a principal driver of Medicaid cost increases over the last uh, number of years and um, almost 40 percent, the contributor of almost 40 percent of the projected increase in Medicaid costs under CBO projections uh, for the balance of this decade has to do with the continued growth in the number of people eligible uh, for the program. Um, since 1988, according to uh, estimates of the Urban Institute, um, the total enrollment in the Medicaid program has increased somewhere in excess of 5 million persons. Um, at the same time, I might note parenthetically um, that uh, the number of people in the United States with private health insurance in the same period of time has fallen uh, by somewhat more um, than 7 million um, uh, people. Um, and so the question is not just the cross-sectional one of how we will um, operate the Medicaid program at the moment, but how uh, states are to have adequate flexibility in an era of constrained uh, spending in order to uh, meet the um, the needs of a growing number of low-income and disabled uh, persons uh, for health care. Uh, we believe Medicaid is the critical safety net for a variety of populations. Um, not only does it cover preventive care for low and moderate income pregnant women and children and long-term care for low-income uh, seniors and persons with disabilities, um, as you noted, uh, but it is, as was noted in the previous panel, the principal provider of long-term care, not only for the elderly but for the seriously uh, disabled of all kinds, including uh, the mentally retar retarded and developmentally disabled. It is the primary source of financing for services with people uh, with HIV in the United States, accounting for somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all health care expenditures um, for um, the HIV infected. It is uh, now the primary source of financing for public mental health services in the United States, exceeding um, any other source um, of federal or state uh, revenue and is the safety net for all middle income families whose parents or adult children are in need of chronic expensive uh, services of one sort um, or another. Again, as we've discussed, um, while the elderly and disabled account for roughly uh, half um, of Medicaid recipients, uh, they account um, for 
um, um, more than 70 percent um, of Medicaid spending. And what's interesting in light of the earlier conversation is in the last decade, the greatest source of growth in Medicaid expenditures has not been on behalf of the elderly. It has been on behalf of the non-elderly disabled um, whose numbers have increased and for whom a variety of services have increasingly been financed through the Medicaid program rather than um, other sources of one sort or another. As you know, um, under current law, um, there are certain populations that states are required to cover if they participate in the Medicaid program and certain services they are required to offer if they participate in the Medicaid program. There are also additional populations the states may choose to cover at state option and additional services that states may choose to cover um, at uh, state option. In 1993, 38% um, only 38% of all Medicaid expenditures were on behalf of mandatory services for mandatory populations. If you exclude um, disproportionate share dollars, as is not um, Can you uh, done say that over table. again? I just, uh, yeah. it went by me. Okay, this is what. Um, and it may be what you could do, because th that's a helpful uh, chart. If you'd put the other chart under, down below, the one that was just up, just put it down on the, down below, right. just since we may make reference to it. Again, and we talked, Thank you. and the previous witnesses talked, I think, quite appropriately about some of the complications of, um, of Medicaid eligibility, but there are um, the overwhelming proportion of uh, Medicaid um, eligibles are eligible by virtue of being recipients of cash assistance, either AFDC um, or SSI. States may, at their option, uh, cover a variety of other uh, folks in the Medicaid program. Similarly, we require states that participate in Medicaid to cover 11 basic uh, services in the program, but we permit them uh, to cover 20 some odd additional services at state option. Um, and as the gentleman from Connecticut noted, Connecticut covers uh, most of those. Um, so that, um, um, in fact, um, if you exclude, which is sort of the next line, uh, state payments, uh, disproportionate share payments that states make as part of their Medicaid program, which nationally are about 12 to 14 percent of all Medicaid expenditures, and were also entirely optional um, on the part of the states. But even if you exclude them, um, if you look at the lower of those two tables, slightly under 44 percent of all state Medicaid expenditures are on behalf of services they are required to cover uh, for people they are required to cover in order um, to participate um, in the Medicaid program. Um, another 35% um, um, of state expenditures are on behalf of individuals who the states have required to, who the states have chosen to cover um, over and above that which is minimally required in order for the states to receive federal financial participation um, in the Medicaid program. To flip the chart the other way, 45 percent of Medicaid expenditures are on services that states are permitted but not required um, to provide um, in order to receive federal uh, matching payments um, under the Medicaid um, program. Um, the point of this chart, of course, is to, is to suggest in some basic structural ways, the extent of flexibility that is currently um, um, available to states under current law, even though we in the administration believe there are important ways in which that flexibility um, ought to be expanded. Um, and the fundamental nature of the partnership uh, between the federal government and the states that has existed in the Medicaid program for the last 30 years um, in which, in effect, the federal government says if the state chooses to meet a set of minimum requirements about coverage um, and benefits, we will provide a federal match of between 50 and 83 percent of the dollars associated with that activity. And in addition, we will match at the same rate a very broad range of additional expenditures the state may, at its option and its discretion, um, choose to make. Um, this has permitted states to uh, develop 57, uh, um, if you count the, um, the territories of the District of Columbia, um, very uh, considerably different Medicaid programs, uh, which vary from one to another um, on almost any uh, dimension one could uh, try to name. Um, but it also provides the states with a considerable degree of automatic protection and the extent to which um, economic circumstances are one sort or another um, 
uh, require or cause an expansion um, in coverage or an expansion of the need for service, federal matching payments are automatically available within the very broad confines of the existing program. Uh, we believe that the, um, the conference agreement uh, would uh, curtail this federal financial uh, responsibility by putting an absolute uh, ceiling on the willingness of the federal government to match state payments, which would throw the partnership out of balance um, in a fundamental way and which makes sense as a matter of arithmetic only if the basic guarantee of coverage for low-income um, elderly and disabled persons that is now the core of the Medicaid program um, were abandoned at the same time. Uh, most simply, we just don't believe that uh, the Medigrant program as uh, contained in um, the balanced budget um, bill um, provides nearly enough funding to continue to provide existing levels of coverage uh, to existing beneficiaries, even with greater program efficiencies, and certainly not to accommodate um, the growth that might come about as a result of economic recession or just continued increase in the number of low-income uh, people um, in this society. Uh, to make matters worse, the provisions in the uh, conference agreement, which reduce the extent of required state matching for uh, something on the order of a dozen states will, we believe, uh, provide those states with a very strong incentive to reduce the level of their contributions um, to Medicaid. Um, if you add um, uh, projections of what um, the states would reduce um, in terms of their spending as permitted under the formula um, in the reconciliation bill uh, with the reductions in federal outlays, we believe that amount would total close to uh, $400 billion um, over seven years, um, an amount that, um, with which it would just not be possible to continue coverage um, of most of the folks who are now um, being covered. Uh, we believe at the same time uh, that we can protect access to high quality health care while providing states with additional uh, flexibility as is outlined in the President's uh, proposal. Uh, we would continue the basic uh, federal partnership um, with um, the, the single change of limiting the growth in per person uh, spending um, by the major categories um, of persons covered. If states had to expand enrollment as a result of population change, uh, more economic circumstances, more than otherwise would have been expected, um, they would receive um, additional federal funds um, in order to cover those folks. Um, federal matching funds would increase as the state population grew, as enrollment grew. Um, there would not be a shift from the federal government to the state necessary to maintain coverage, which we believe would, in that instance, clearly constitute um, a f an unfunded mandate. In fact, what a block grant does, in effect, is transfer all of the financial risk of operation of the Medicaid program uh, to the states who can be expected under their obligations to balance their budget and meet competing priorities uh, to shift that risk further downstream um, onto the poorest and most vulnerable members of our society um, if they are not to incur significant um, additional costs as some of the uh, later witnesses will expect. Nonetheless, uh, we believe that states ought to have considerably more flexibility uh, in operating their Medicaid programs. Uh, we have been in almost continuous discussion with the National Governors Association, the State Medicaid Directors Association, other representatives of state governments. Uh, since this administration began, they have made a number of proposals uh, to us, um, and we have um, incorporated a large number of them um, in the President's proposal. In light of the earlier discussion, I would in particularly um, emphasize uh, three of those. Uh, first, uh, the President's proposal would eliminate uh, the so-called Bourne Amendment, the um, requirements uh, associated with how states pay institutional providers, hospitals, and nursing homes, and the legal liability that has evolved for states under um, that requirement. We would provide states with substantially more flexibility to um, develop a variety of managed care arrangements and to mandate the participant participation of Medicaid um, enrollees in um, those networks, and we would uh, make it substantially easier in administrative terms uh, for states to move larger and larger share of their long-term care uh, systems, both for the elderly and the disabled, uh, to uh, community-based uh, service systems out of an institutional uh, focus. Um, 
These can all be done while maintaining the safety net for everyone who is currently eligible for coverage or who is likely to be eligible um, in the future, and while constraining the rate of cost growth for both the federal government um, and the states. Um, we believe it is possible to moderate the growth of costs in the Medicaid program. Um, we believe it can be done uh, without jeopardizing um, the guarantee of coverage as long as um, the uh, basic financial partnership between the federal and state government um, remains in place and the incentives on states uh, forced to economize or seeking to economize are in the direction of greater efficiency or reductions in payments to providers rather than reduction in coverage. Um, we believe that that's what the President's proposal would um, achieve um, and that is necessary to continue on that vein um, in order to protect this essential and irreplaceable uh, safety net for the most vulnerable members of our population. I appreciate again the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to, uh, to appear here today and of course I'm happy to re respond to any questions. Thank you. I found your testimony very interesting and helpful and uh, let me just outline kind of where, where I'm what I'm wrestling with, and, and um, happy to hear your comments. I've served on the Budget Committee for a number of years. I was elected in 87, and uh, uh, I, I, had, I vowed that this country needed to get its financial house in order and have been part of that group within Congress, uh, am among which there are some Democrats as, as well, obviously, as Republicans, who want to get our financial house in order and balance the budget. When I look at government spending, I've realized for the last eight years I voted on one-third of the budget. I vote on discretionary spending, uh, defense, non-defense, what comes out of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, Two-thirds of the budget is basically on automatic pilot. It's uh, you fit the entitlement, you get the money. Um, and then you have the interest rates, which are about 15 percent of the, of the total budget. There is no way conceivable that we can balance our budget unless we slow the growth of entitlements. Not cut them, slow the growth, which is, I think the President has acknowledged that as well because in his program he chooses to save 52 billion uh, over seven years uh, as opposed to um, our savings of 133 in which we dropped it down to 85, which disappoint me. I'd like to stay at 133, but are close to it. Now, um, we can't keep the government on automatic pilot and balance the federal budget. And then there are people who say, well, tax cuts, no tax cuts. I'd be more than willing, and a number of my colleagues would, some wouldn't, to get rid of all the tax cuts and balance the budget in six years. What my interest is, is to get that 50% of the budget that's on automatic pilot and to not have it grow so much. Now, the other part of the equation for me is that uh, because of the additional add-ons that the federal government has done, which some are mandatory and some are optional, uh, on the states, uh, we've seen Medicaid grow during certain times, during certain years, recent years, of 20% a year. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare now constitute 17.6% uh, of the entire federal budget. Medicare and Medicaid are equal to all domestic discretionary spending, <coughs> equal to it. Now, we have continually squeezed discretionary spending. I have sympathy with the President's view that we're squeezing discretionary spending, uh, domestic. Where my challenge is, we've got to slow the growth of Medicare and Medicaid. Now, um, looking at, at your, uh, your chart, uh, there are parts that are mandatory. In other words, if you choose to be part of Medicare and all Medicaid, and, and I, I think it's disingenuous to assume that a state wouldn't, uh, if you choose now, these are the rules. Um, I'll just put another bias that I have on the table. In the state level, I saw states doing innovative things. I don't see it on the federal level. I see the state adding up, uh, the federal government adding up everybody in this room, uh, gets the number of people, adds up all the shoe sizes, and it says, there we are, size eight and a half fits all. And I would dispute your, your basic sense that there is flexibility in this. Um, and obviously we would have a debate on that. What are, what would you call, um, you have mandatory people and optional people, and this is a very helpful chart to, to have a discussion, and I thank you for having it. You have mandatory people, you have optional people, you have mandatory services, you have optional services, and you, you've thoughtfully broken that down. Um, 
describe to me the optional people that you call optional. In other words, the federal, you can be part of Medicaid, but you don't have to have optional people. What would be an optional um, person? I think the largest numbers of, <coughs> of, of so-called optional people are, um, are in two categories. One are uh, the so-called medically needy. States may but are not required um, to cover folks who would qualify for cash assistance uh, if you ignored that part of their income that they have to spend on medical care. Okay. So in other words, if you're a person with even a median income in some states, but you have to spend five or $6,000 a month on medical care because you're um, of a chronic illness of some sort or another, um, you m and that five or $6,000 a month, when subtracted from your total income, would otherwise make you eligible for, for AFDC give or me, SSI. Give me some other optional people. Um, th that's the largest group of okay. medically needy. The second group of medically needy states are required um, to cover um, AFDC recipients and um, children up to the age of 13 um, under 100% of the poverty level, and pregnant women um, up to 100% of the poverty level. That's the level. AFDC? <coughs> well, some of them, no, they can, children must be covered up to 100% of the poverty level whether their oh, parents AFDC are receiving or AFDC okay. or not. So working poor. Um, or, or, states yeah. may extend that coverage up to 185% of the poverty right. level. Um, and so there are two very disparate groups okay. in that other people okay. category. Now, and so, I w so your point would be states don't have to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Most states do, correct? Um, I believe about two-thirds of the states um, cover some or all of the medically, yeah. have some degree of medically needy program, but only about a third of the states cover more than the minimally required okay. low-income mothers. Now, you described, uh, you know, a bulk of the optional people. How about describing the bulk of the optional services? Um, a lot of the optional services have to do with particular kinds of, of providers of services or um, or additional services that are not in the basic Medicaid package. Um, podiatrists are the ones that we always used to fight about in New York all the time. Uh, dental services um, for m large parts of the Medicaid population are in optional services. Um, 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 actually, the most expensive optional service by far is, um, is pharmaceutical drug coverage, which is not um, required to be covered, but most states, I think all the states do. Um, a variety of home and community-based uh, services, long-term care services that are thought to substitute uh, for institutional care are optional for the states, but many states take, exam take advantage of them. Uh, Non-medical transportation is, um, is a so-called facilitative service, physical therapy, occupational therapy on an outpatient basis. Okay, uh, there's a list of about 30 such services. If, so basically, is it, is it your contention that, f uh, am I reading this correctly, that if I take mandatory services, what number there describes the optional people and the optional services? Is it the 45.5 percent? No, the, 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 the optional people and optional services is that um, 24 percent of the, of the total are, are people who the federal government does not require the states cover right. for services right. that the state does not no, require. But what, what would define here in your chart the total amount of, gov of spending that is optional? Well, as I guess the total amount of spending that's optional is the uh, total to amount that is not in the upper left-hand box. So it would be 56% of state Medicaid spending and the federal match of it is right. not mandated by the federal Medicaid program. Okay. What, what, not to turn something around, but to turn something around. Um, what you described to me is something quite significant. States on their own are choosing to spend 56% of all the costs. So why do you have such a concern that states will be irresponsible if we give them discretion? Well, states have made that choice, Mr. Chairman, under a deal in which the federal government matches them anywhere between a dollar for dollar and uh, three dollars per dollar. Sorry. If if there is no additional federal dollars associated with a change in state expenditure patterns, you would expect a rational state uh, to behave very differently. Well, you know, I'm listening to that, and I'm, for you, that's a satisfactory entry. For me, it's not, because um, I know my state of Connecticut, yes, has to match 50 percent. Uh, my point to you is that the bottom line is states have chosen. You can't have it both ways and say it's optional and then say they option it, and now it's not significant. It's op they, uh, they option it, and they choose to. They don't have to. 
And my state could save a hell of a lot of dollars by choosing not to have that service. Mm -hmm. But they choose not to. Mr. They Chairman, I've yeah. heard the argument in your state and every other state mm -hmm. made by providers every time the state proposes to cut any part of the Medicaid program. They say, you're going to save $20 million in the state budget and cost the state $20 million in federal dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard the argument in every time states have proposed to reduce their outlays on Medicaid, mm -hmm. um, the argument is made that for every dollar the state saves, the uh, beneficiaries of the service and the providers um, in the system um, lose um, between two and four dollars, depending on the state you're in. And um, um, the converse of that is it has given the states a greater incentive uh, to expand coverage mm -hmm. Uh, because of the availability of the open-ended federal match, absolutely. You know, but what's interesting is you take some states that have a 50% match and they choose to spend more than some states that get 80% 80, 80 federal dollars, which is, you know, kind of a, an interesting, uh, uh, to me it's at least interesting that uh, um, even with a greater incentive. But let me, um, let, let me ask you this now. When I look at uh, nursing care, and um, were we, states are required to have ombudsman. Is that federal That's or federal. state requirement? That's federal. Yeah. Why is it logical? And why is it cost effective? And why is it right to have an ombudsman that can say to a nursing home, uh, you had two patients in room A and you had two patients in room B, and one patient in each room no longer is there, passed away. Now you have one in each. And the nursing home petitions the... the um, uh, the advocate to be able to move it and the advocate says no you can't move that patient why is that logical what you're referring to is the ability to change a patient's room without the patient's consent one of the basic principles of the nursing home reforms embodied in over 87 um, coming out of the report of the Institute of Medicine was that merely by virtue of the fact that an individual is a resident of a nursing home, they should not lose their rights as a citizen or their dignity as a human being. And to take someone and say, because you're a nursing home resident, we are moving you from this room to that room for the convenience of the facility without your consent, uh, struck a number of us as a violation of the basic dignity of the individual. Well, you have just illustrated to me why I want the states to have this decision. You on high basically decide, in a sense, that a nursing home can't save the taxpayers money uh, and, and be able to put those two individuals into one room. The, the room looks the same, is the same. It's maybe one room down. But instead, that nursing home now has two patients, each having their own room. It's logical that patient may want to stay there and, not, and have the room all to themselves. But it sure isn't cost effective. Um, Mr. Chairman, there's nothing in the rules, federal or state, that, permits, that prevents the facility from bringing another patient into each of those rooms. Right. But maybe they can't do it for a week or two or three. And, and the decision was made, and I would defend it. And, I, and, and let, me, let me generalize from your comment on why we think it's important to have a federal role. We believe that the mere fact that an individual, because of illness or poverty, requires federal and state support for the receipt of medical care should not require them to lose their rights or their dignities as a citizen of this country in the receipt of medical care. You make it, it should not give them yeah. less freedom to get care or to be treated like a citizen than anyone else who enters the medical care system. I agree with that. But you make a quantum leap in my judgment. And I, I acknowledge to you this is just one. But it's just one replete with, with a whole host of others. And and, you know, I believe you believe that. And, 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 I, and, and you believe basically the federal government should be able to have a system that uh, uh, prevents efficiencies and that basically costs the taxpayers a hell of a lot of dollars. No, sir. Uh, I, I have not defended everything in that book. We've okay. talked about it, and, okay. and I think that's a misstatement of the okay. position of the administration. Okay. We believe let that large parts of that let me book say, let me ought just to stop be repealed. Second. I do not want to put words in your mouth. So if that's the case, let me say it to me. It appears to me that that's what's being said. Now, wh what is your point? Well, let me be very explicit. We believe that large parts of that book, um, as they relate to requirements on provider payment methodologies, 
ought to be eliminated, that large parts of that book, as they uh, limit the ability of states to engage in home and community-based care or in managed care, um, ought to be eliminated, that the eligibility process ought to be considerably simplified, which is where most of the regulations by page and um, by volume in the Medicaid system have to do with this eligibility, and we agree strenuously that that should be uh, radically simplified. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there are parts of uh, the requirements in that uh, book that we believe must be maintained in order to protect uh, the rights and the dignity of the beneficiaries of the program. And one part of that about which I will confess I feel particularly strongly because of my own background are the federal requirements about quality of care and quality of life in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Quality of care, is it defined by the number of nurses versus the number of patients? Um, as a matter of fact, there is no federal standard, mm -hmm. um, a quantitative standard on the relationship of the number of nurses uh, to the number of patients. There is a standard that um, yeah. gives individual facilities uh, and states a considerable amount of discretion um, in adjusting nurse staffing to meet uh, patterns of, of particular practice or particular needs of residents. It's your testimony that there is no federal requirement to have a certain level of staffing at nursing homes? Uh, there is a federal requirement to have an adequate level of staffing. There is not a quantitative requirement at the federal level that says for each resident there shall be X number of nursing uh, nurses or of nursing hours I, other than the minimum of one RN. One RN for what? Uh, per shift, per facility. Okay, per, they could have 300 patients with one RN? Um, um, I believe so, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Souter? <clears throat> My initial question is on the chart with the yellow on it on the mandatory yes. services and mandatory people. Has that 43.5% stayed relatively constant? Is that, or is this a new set of data? Has that been increasing? That's a very good question, sir, that I don't know the answer to, and we'll try to, to get it to you um, in the next few days. My impression is it has probably been decreasing, um, but I honestly, that's a guess, and I'd rather, if, if you'll permit us, um, um, by early next week get you some real uh, quantitative answer to that. I don't want to um, belabor an individual point. <clears throat> and as you know, you, we've been in touch with you and Indiana's been in touch with you on their, their concern. I would rather use it as an illustrative uh, question um, that um, in this question of, of flexibility, we had a number of things that the earlier witnesses had raised that I will ask in more detail. I know that uh, Mr. Prella from Connecticut uh, had said that he was concerned about the second round of questions that came and it delayed the program uh, by about uh, uh, four or five months and, and their ability to funding. And in, in Indiana, the particular question <clears throat> relates to a number of our urban hospitals where uh, a separate hospital fee was uh, assessed and uh, it's still being debated in, uh, as of December meeting, I guess, uh, for 93 and 94 reimbursement because the question was as if it had been general broad-based revenue, it would have been reimbursable, but because it was uh, a hospital tax, uh, it was not. And for example, we have one hospital in Fort Wayne that mostly takes care of uh, the lower income uh, people. It seems to be rather um, a, a narrow definition. If the state had taken that money into the general revenue fund and done it, it would have been eligible, but since they did it a, a direct way, it wasn't. Uh, why would it be that narrow? Is it financially driven concern at the federal level? It seems like an awful uh, a narrow thing to have uh, not granted a waiver over. Um, uh, Mr. Sutter, all I can tell you is that um, um, the particular um, development and refinement of a variety of, of provider tax arrangements as well as um, 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 other ways of get raising disproportionate share funds for hospitals um, are really the cause of that spike in the Medicaid expenditures in the 1988 through 91 period, as a result of which the previous administration uh, proposed and had enacted legislation um, to limit the ability of states to raise Medicaid dollars through those tax um, arrangements. And frankly, sir, uh, it by is the way, I, w I want to reinforce that because I was on Senator Coates' staff at the time, and we were going around with the Bush administration it's uh, a, as well. It's a very complicated statute. Um, the previous administration also um, issued proposed regulations uh, very late um, in 1992 to implement that statute. Um, the states felt very strongly 
um, that those regulations were too rigid and did not provide the states with enough discretion. Um, when uh, this administration came into office, we um, undertook to rewrite the regulations in a consultative process with the National Governors Association representing the states. It is still a very complicated um, set of rules. And as the instance of, um, of Indiana um, illustrates, um, we are first in the first generation of seeking to apply these very complicated rules to some very complicated situations. Um, we are trying to be as um, as, um, as painstaking and as careful as we can not to uh, take money away from uh, providers who deserve it um, when we can appropriately. We do have this complicated statute that we're obligated to enforce and we're just trying to, to work our way through it. We would support, um, it's not, I don't believe in any of the, well obviously it's not relevant under block grant, it's not in the President's Bill, we would support some um, efforts to simplify that. Um, and in fact much of the need for the 91 statute was supplanted by the further limitations on disproportionate share payments enacted as part of OBRA 93. And none of us yet, frankly, have really looked at the extent to which OBRA 93 requirements ought to permit us to simplify the 91 requirements, but we would certainly be willing to do that. It becomes <clears throat> very critical <clears throat> because many of these hospitals are serving the portion of the population that's getting squeezed in this chart here. Uh, basically low-income families and, and children uh, who uh, partly are being uh, uh, squeezed in Indiana because of a, what amounted to an unfunded federal mandate on disability because the federal disability law broadened it from what the Indiana disability law was, transferred Indiana funds. They tried to address that to try to be able to cover low-income kids. We have a number of major hospitals in our state that uh, are constantly on the margin as to whether they're going to close and this funding becomes very critical because of while you're sorting through and saying this is, is very difficult, we're getting squeezed at both ends of the unfunded mandates changing the state forced allocation, then they try to address that question and then that being not wavered uh, when they thought it was going to be waverable and that's why we're pushing hard on that. No, I understand question. sir, but with all respect and, and I'm really not as familiar as I probably ought to be about Indiana, but to, um, there are a number of states which um, are financing uh, disproportionate, and I don't believe this is the case in Indiana, but which are financing disproportionate share hospital programs without any state revenues whatsoever, um, essentially with federal dollars matching hospital dollars. And um, to the extent that um, implementation of the 91 or 93 laws creates difficulty for those hospitals, um, we find ourselves in a very hard I'll ask you place. A technical. Because, if the, if um, they had a hospital fee that went to the general revenue right. fund, and then that money came out of general revenue, right. would that not be eligible? That's correct. And and but as you're well aware, state governments in the last decade, for a variety of reasons, um, in order to support these institutions, including many that were traditionally supported by county revenues, tax revenues, for example, uh, found a way to uh, use federal funds to do it without. Um, state or county tax levies going to them and um, um, it's created some real problems and we're going to try to work them through as best we can to protect yeah, the institutions I'll, and the people. I under, uh, understand it. What I view a hospital tax as a state and local tax of a different form that's and that's part of it. I, I want to revisit because it's a fundamental, well, let me ask you an angle off the state question first. Um, you raised the question of what if there was a recession or a downtime in a state and there wasn't a federal program to protect. Um, how do you feel about, um, this has come up in other forms of our block granting program. Senator Luger from Indiana has expressed it in the relationship to uh, school lunches and some of the food stamp programs because Indiana from time to time has been known to be uh, automobile prone recession uh, related. Um, how would you feel about some sort of a, uh, a fallback kind of rainy day protection that if you had, if you, you would have a trigger that the state then would partially reimburse when it went up in a boom time? Um, Mr. Shadow, I, my, um, my real answer is that I don't know enough about that to give you a fully informed answer. My understanding is, um, which is, is not a very sophisticated one, that there is such a mechanism um, in the unemployment insurance system. Right, um, that's what we have And um, that I was a resident um, um, or involved in government in the, in the state of New Jersey at a time where the bankruptcy of that and the requirement of borrowing from the federal um, I think created enormous problems for the state. Um, their state now has the 
opposite political problem of having probably a very large surplus, which is very difficult for um, officials to keep their hands off of taxes, and to use. So, um, but I guess my basic answer is um, I think there are a variety of ways to protect the states. The, the bottom line from our perspective is to protect the individuals, and it seems to us the best way to protect the individuals is to combine um, a, a guarantee to the individual of coverage along with mechanisms that adjust for changing needs of the states. It's a, um, this subject can get uh, tense quick, and I don't want to get, I don't want to get into that. There, there is, but there is a philosophical question that um, is, I thought you want to get into it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, not me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm non-controversial. Okay. That um, <laughs> the, my, con my concern is, is that the, in some of the earlier questions in this is that um, that while the intent is to be protective of individuals, it really sounds pejorative to the people in the states that they aren't, uh, and that uh, this is true in a lot of of, of issues of of only the government federal government can protect the disabled. They're the only ones who can protect the frail elderly. They're the only ones who can protect uh, minorities. And that's, uh, I mean, I'm not interested in defending our governor from Indiana. He's not one of my favorite people. Uh, playing to run against my former boss. Uh, that, um, but I think it's a little bit of a slight to imply that he doesn't have as much concern for senior citizens in Indiana as the federal government does, or that he for somehow, for some reason, is going to uh, not meet the needs. Uh, you even implied at one point in your testimony that they would uh, cut back uh, if given flexibility to cut back. That's not only saying that they wouldn't cover, but they would actually reduce services if they had the option. Mm -hmm. Then you added the additional interesting comment that it was because um, they have budget needs and priorities. So do we. We're the ones in debt. Indiana has a constitutional amendment to keep them from going in debt, so they have to do that way. We're here trying to figure out how in seven years from now we can get to an annual uh, uh, balanced budget, yet alone have this overriding interest. Um, why uh, do you think that their budget needs and priorities um, are going to take priority over our budget needs and priorities? And secondly, what makes you think, for example, even nursing homes, my friend Bob Alderman, who's a state legislator, has worked real hard on nursing home protection for seniors in Indiana. Why do you think that uh, the people of Indiana and other states are less caring than a few people in Washington? That's the implication, even though I don't think it's personal that way, uh, certainly not from Democrat to Democrat. In, in our state? Well, I think that's a very, that's a very good point. And I, I must, again, if I may, sort of add a bit of a personal um, dimension to it, which is that uh, for another couple of months, I guess I still will have spent more of my career in state, as a state government official than as a federal official. So I, um, I'm very sympathetic to what you say about folks who work in, in state government. Um, uh, and I guess there, the answer I would give you is, is twofold. In a sense, if what we see as a set of minimum protections that need to be um, established at the federal level are things the states would do anyway, then the federal requirement is not a burden on the state if the state were to do it anyway. Um, it's like um, you know, telling my kids that um, they have to finish the pizza. I mean, um, <laughs> they will complain probably that I'm being... Um, there I'm telling them what to do again, but they're going to eat it anyway. And if states are going to cover all these folks and provide them with all these services um, and protect the dignity of nursing home residents, then federal requirements that they do it should not be an additional burden on the, on the states. The second thing is, frankly, and unfortunately, and I recognize that the world changes in a variety of ways, but one of the reasons we express some of the concerns we do about what states would do under a block grant situation or in the absence of some of the requirements of the federal law is the historical record. Um, and there is a considerable historical record in many of these areas um, of including during the history of the Medicaid program and certainly prior to the history of the Medicaid program. Um, and uh, many of them have to do with issues um, that um, are still very relevant today. Um, and let me just give one example in that regard. It's come, one of the things we've had very extensive discussions um, with the governors about um, and with um, members of Congress of both parties, um, and um, as we've proceeded these negotiations over the last couple of months, and, and Mr. Shea is an issue that has a very interesting resonance in Connecticut, 
um, has to do with the requirement in the Medicaid law that if a benefit is provided um, to any group um, within um, the Medicaid program by a state, um, the same rule, the state may limit the availability, may limit the number of hospital days that are provided, may limit the number of physicians' visits, and may limit the amount of prescriptions, but it has to have the same rules statewide. And I think Mr. Perella raised questions about um, that so-called statewideness requirement um, um, for um, um, the, its limitations on the flexibility in the state of Connecticut to operate their program. The fact of the matter is that among the folks who receive uh, Medicaid coverage um, around the country are somewhere between half a million and three quarters of a million Native Americans who tend in most states for very obvious historical reasons to be concentrated in very limited areas of those states. And as recently as this year, we have had comments from people who run Medicaid programs that are forced to cut back if they weren't under statewide obligations because of the politics of the relationship between the federal government and the states and the tribes. They would give the responsibility for providing health services to the tribes back to the federal government. Um, now, statewideness actually comes in the first instance from the fact that the Medicaid law was first enacted the year after the Civil Rights Act was enacted. Um, and those concerns have taken on different forms. The world has changed. Um, in many ways, the states are much more uh, sophisticated, and, and certainly their um, professionalism of both their legislators and their administrative agencies is enormously greater than it was 30 years ago um, in a variety of ways. But I think some of the continuing um, interest um, from the point of view of the federal government in these issues remains. One last issue if I might, and that tends, I think, to get a little bit overlooked in this regard. Um, we are talking, and, and it's one of the odd things about sitting where I sit relative to these debates. We are talking, as um, the chairman noted, about a considerable fraction of the federal budget here. We are talking this fiscal year, now that we have a continuing resolution for these payments uh, for this part of the year, of just under a hundred billion federal dollars. Um, and what is remarkable to me is the extent to which the Congress of the United States is prepared to send out to the states $100 billion a year with only one book's worth of requirements and regulations. Uh, because the prudent um, administration this is the of summary. federal funds... This is the summary of a hell of a lot of other The prudent laws. administration of federal funds, we're talking about a lot of money here and a lot of the limitations on state flexibility are there as limitations on federal financial liability. Um, and um, it, anyway, that's a, a third observation relative to your question. I, I, uh, if I can make a brief comment and then sure. you look back, that, back and, that I, I, under, I understand uh, a lot of the historical examples that led to the uh, type of attitude that you said, and we still obviously in most states have downstate versus upstate or out Chicago versus Chicago or you have all kinds of variations like that. And um, while I understand that, that in a sense there are historic sins, I still do not agree with the basic premise that just because something happened before that it's necessarily going to happen again. I think that the mere nature that the federal government was involved has changed the debate in the states on any issue that the federal government got involved, whether it's civil rights, education, any other. And uh, bottom line is, is that when all was said and done, what you said was is that you felt that the states would have weaker standards and that they would, governors and the people in those states wouldn't protect their most vulnerable. Those are the same people that elect this Congress and this president. And when you make a, a judgment about their willingness to defend, uh, if that's a problem in our society, it's a problem that's going to go through the whole system because you've in effect said the American people in their states interested in protecting as much as we are here in Washington. Uh, even though you gave all the reasons for it, that was your ultimate conclusion that there's a danger in doing that. And I, I uh, while I understand there's some risk and we have to watch the funds and it is not uh, revenue sharing, it's block granting. So we have the right, as long as we're raising the revenue, to watch that, to put conditions in. Um, uh, I think they, personally, they will exercise their responsibility. And I know that's a difference. One of the astounding things for me was to come to grips with this subcommittee overseeing HHS and when it includes Social Security, we realized that the combined budget of HHS and Social Security was larger than the gross domestic product of Canada. And, and here we're trying to regulate it. 
I think it is humanly impossible for Hikva to take on this task. Um, I'm going to concede a few points. One of the points I'm going to concede is that, um, and, and I'm directly responsible because I'm the task force chairman of Medicare and Medicaid on the Budget Committee. We, spent, we, we earmarked savings numbers and then told the authorizing committees, we would like you to allow the growth to go to this point, not to this point. The number we, we got for Medicare, in my judgment, works tremendously well. I happen to believe that no increase in copayment deduction and so on, the n amount of money allowing choice and so on, and we would disagree on this, but where I, uh, where I concede to you is that if any money were to be added, Medicare, Medicaid, it should be in the Medicaid one. We allow a 7.2% growth in Medicare. We don't allow for the same growth in Medicaid. One of the points that I'm just going to parenthetically say to you is that in the course of the president staking out his territory of quote unquote protecting Medicare and Medicaid, that I hope these negotiators, of which my own party is obviously a part, if they ultimately come to agreement, put more money into the Medicaid than the Medicare because I don't think we need to put more money into Medicare. Now we may disagree, but I just want to put that on the record. Where I can see to you is that the number that, that I helped set, we should have put more money into Medicaid, particularly in the out year. Now, now, having said that, what I'm wrestling with are a whole host of problems here. Um, I don't think HICFA can do the job. And, and that's why I, I decided the first time you appeared on, in front of us, I could bring out a litany of, of crazy things. We don't know how much hospitals are paid. We don't know why they're paid it. We make idiotic uh, uh, billing mistakes of you know, $16 ends up being 116000 I mean, and on and on. We bill, we bill men for, for giving birth, I mean, and on and on and on. Now, I don't blame you, and I made that decision early on that, that what, a, what a setup. I mean, I think you know HICFA is the bunt of a lot of criticism. My basic contention is that you can't do the job, that it is humanly impossible to regulate from the federal level such, as you point out, such a gigantic amount. Now, where I can make a, a concession to you is that I do think there has to be basic requirements. Now, the next issue, though, is can we block grant it and do basic requirements? I think we can. Or we do, do we still have it, quote, unquote, a capped entitlement or an entitlement? And I don't think we have to go the entitlement route, and I think we shouldn't. So, you know, there's kind of where we, we have disagreements on numbers, and then we have ultimately a disagreement on the program. Can you describe to me some of the innovation that I've seen come out of the federal government in Medicare and Medicaid? Innovation, savings of programs and some money, and wh where do I see that innovation? Well, on, on Medicaid, let me just um, uh, say, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, that um, we try to operate the program um, in a way that um, the states do the innovating because the states run the program, we oversee it, um, and we oversee the um, allocation of money. Let me give you one particular example, however, um, in the case of, um, um, of Medicaid. Um, and um, um, I'm sorry Mr. Waxman isn't here for this discussion because this was largely a result of his doing. Right. Um, the fact of the I matter... I just want to, for the record, I know he is... He is probably in agony right now. <laughs> and nothing is worse than you think, my God, he's down there and I'm not there. <laughs> so, so I feel for him. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> and, and I say this sincerely, that, that it would add to this, uh, having his presence would, uh, would be very helpful. And so it's unfortunate he's not here. Uh, the fact of the matter is, since um, um, he uh, wrote legislation in 1982, I believe, um, to um, take the first steps in the expansion of home and community-based services for the elderly um, in Medicaid. Um, about 80% in the growth of the number of people receiving long-term care in the Medicaid program has been in home and community-based services. We talk all the time um, about how the system is still too dependent on nursing homes and not using enough home and community-based services, and we would agree with that. 
Uh, but in fact, since 1982, the overwhelming proportion of the growth spurred to a considerable extent by federal policy and federal policy changes in that regard. The issue there is even more dramatic for the seriously retarded and developmentally disabled, where since 1982 we've gone from a situation um, in which most of them were institutionalized into a situation in which most of them are in community residences or in the community. Now, the states, of course, have done that. Many, I might add, under state court order. Um, but in fact, it was changes in the Medicaid program um, that permitted them to do that, that provided them with the financial incentives to do that, that in some ways shaped and directed uh, that deinstitutionalization of that. See, uh, I, would, that I would give that an, as an example, um, that I believe in home care, but I believe that that's the area where we're having the biggest abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, gigantic abuses, mm -hmm. and I can relay uh, story after story in my own district of, of, of senior citizen homes where you have home health care providers who are coming into the homes basically as companions. I have nursing homes where they will describe that a nursing care physician will come into the nursing home and provide care, see people for 10 minutes, uh, and see, uh, uh, you know, 10 people doing a, in a very short period of time collecting a sizable dollars. The big weakness in my judgment with our plan is that we didn't take on the home health care industry uh, because they have become a powerful political block. So, I mean, we would, you know, where you would call it innovation, I would say a gigantic danger zone out there, and the states uh, don't have an ability to get a handle on it. Um, but let me... Uh, I think we're talking about... Let me, if I can just say a few sure, words about Medicare, sure. and, and I... I frankly, and, and trying to keep this as, as collegial a hearing as possible, there um, are um, um, of issues of, of periods in which Medicare was substantially more innovative than other periods in its history. But the fact is, on the back office functions for running a health insurance company, uh, Medicare is so far ahead in terms of automation and the use of automated technologies of any other health insurer, public or private, in the world, that the only ones who are even close are our contractors who've been able to piggyback on our electronic data transmission systems, could, could on we, our electronic remittance yeah. systems, and so forth. Could we pursue that just a little bit? Because, I mean, I just, I have a hard time. I mean, we're, we're examining what we're doing with our automated system. Why can't you tell me what a hospital gets? Uh, I can tell you what it gets in the Medicare program. I absolutely okay. can. Uh, how many weeks later? Um, I can tell you um, generally the next day if you want last year's information since um, if you want current year's information I can only tell you what they've accrued I can't tell you what um, yeah. they will eventually be paid no I, you can't tell me what they're eventually gonna be paid but but bottom line is when we've had our hearing and we'll get you know we'll have a hearing on this I mean with all due respect the system is broken down we have nine different units nine different areas uh -huh. these units all these areas all use different coding they don't use the same coding, so when we bill from one district to another, from one area to another, they don't mean the same thing. I mean, we could, we could get into a big story about this one, but, I mean, <laughs> that to me, it's interesting that, that the two issues you're bringing up, home care, I'm thinking danger zone, you're bringing up the automated system, and I think the system is basically breaking down. We're having a postponement of, of, of when the new system gets online, uh, it's not. It's not keeping up to uh, up up on schedule. So I mean, I I don't I don't think that is uh, anything to 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 be too excited about. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what that last issue is is referring to, sir. But I would I would say that none of the innovations that have ever occurred in the Medicare Medicaid program have been perfect. But the yeah. fact of the matter is um, that. Um, innovations everywhere are rarely perfect. Um, we could cite lots of state level or private sector innovations that have in the aggregate been good things that there are problems with. I, I think at this point it becomes a sort of silly kind of debate. Um, no, it's, it's not silly. The one thing that's, that's true is you can't be blamed for the system not working. That's the one thing true. You are in charge, but you are in charge in my judgment of a system almost impossible to operate. We spend so much we have such large billings. We have a disjointed system of keeping track. We don't use the same codes. I mean, that's fact. That's not. That's I, I not. I don't know what you're referring to. But. but you don't know the fact that when we bill, that from area to area, that we use different codes. We use the same code, sir. 
the computer system within the our computer, computer system used nine different sets of software. That's correct. Right. But the billing codes are the same. They're okay. uniform. Because we haven't replaced it. We haven't yeah. put a unified system in place yeah. yet. Well, that's kind of where I'm headed. And this isn't the, the gist of the hearing, but it's just to give you a sense of where of my mind. Now, the other area where I, where I have this, this, this question mark, one of the challenges that we think we have with the system is, as you rightfully point out, um, even my state, when it spends 50 cents, it gets a dollar. Some states, when they send 20 uh, cents, they get a dollar. And there's the danger that states have in not fully grasping that some of this money that's getting wasted because it's not their dollar isn't worth focusing in on. And so one of the uh, uh, interests that we have is to have the state have the full, feel the full impact when it does make a savings. In other words, when it makes a savings, it doesn't save 50 cents on the dollar. When it makes a savings, it saves 100%. When it finds waste, fraud, and abuse, it makes 100%. So that's another part of this logic of saying, you know, two different people are responsible. Let's have one party responsible for the savings and the management and let that party realize the full benefit from it. It's the problem of basically, since it's a federal dollar, who cares? Mm -hmm. Now we want to make it a state dollar and we want them to care a lot more, and we think they will. What's wrong with that logic? Well, I, you know, your notion of two people instead of one, it seems to me the entire constitutional theory of the United States is one of checks and balances, and that's what we have in the existing Medicaid system, and that's mm -hmm. what you largely remove in a block grant, mm -hmm. whether it's a block grant for Medicaid or a block grant for community mm -hmm. development or a block grant for anything else. Um, and um, it is true that um, as systems of checks and balances, just as that between the executive and the legislative branch, um, d produce a degree of um, cumbersomeness and uh, time-consuming and paperwork that our uh, colleagues in parliamentary systems or our colleagues in unitary countries don't have to deal with. But um, sure, if they're 100 percent federal dollars, uh, if they become 100 percent state dollars, it is true that the states may be more careful with them. It's also true that they may choose, as states tried in the early 1990s, to spend med federal Medicaid dollars on highways um, and state university construction rather than on health services to poor people. Let and I think from the point of view of a federal official, it's very important to me that every one of those dollars, and of course I don't personally oversee every dollar, sir, but I do believe um, that, um, that the size of the system is not our major administrative problem. The fact is, if the states get $97 billion of federal taxpayers' dollars to provide health services for low-income people, I think we as federal officials, whether in the executive or legislative branch, have a responsibility to see that those dollars are spent on health services to low-income people. Before we go on to Mr. Schott, let me just ask you this. Do you, uh, in our um, putting aside the money, putting aside the block grant issue, on, uh, with our Medicare, Medicaid, we are making it a now a federal offense. We're making it uh, uh, contra. You don't have to get someone basically for uh, for wire or, or mail fraud. You can get them for medical fraud. Does the administration agree with that thrust in in, in our legislation? I believe we have, sir. Yeah. yeah okay. No. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chowder. I'm not a big as beautiful fan, so I'm you're not. Sure a, you're not a what? <clears throat> a big as beautiful fan. Okay. Uh, I believe that the country is moving towards decentralization, and that, uh, I understand that you need some standards and in checks and balances. But I had a very particular question in the. 27% of the recipients who are in the aged, blind, and disabled category that get 69% of the money. I also thought I heard you say that the money for the elderly hasn't changed much. As a share, sir, as, as a, a proportion. So, as a, yeah. uh, so that presumably the, that uh, growth has been in the disabled area? Yes, sir. Um, and you said that was partly because they were getting the money from other sources. Yeah. What would some of the other sources be? Well, just for example, and, and you made reference, and I think this is an issue where the states have a real beef about mandates and, and where in the context of other legislation the administration has tried to work with the Congress. Um, there was a very substantial expansion de facto in the definition of disability in the 1980s um, in the areas of uh, mental illness and substance abuse as the primary or um, corollary causes of disability. Um, what that has meant in many states is that many uh, chronically mentally ill people or chronic substance abusers or both, because there are many who are both, 
who are traditionally treated entirely in state-run and state-financed um, services and institutions, um, although there used to be more federal funding until it was block granted and cut for those services, um, are now covered by Medicaid. They're eligible for Medicaid. And uh, those uh, mental health and substance abuse services are now being f paid for under Medicaid programs. And um, that's probably the single biggest piece of that. I mean, Medicaid is so big and so complex, there's a lot of pieces. But of that growth in the outlays for the disabled, for the non-elderly disabled, that's probably the biggest single piece um, in the 1980s. So you're saying some of the squeeze on low-income children and seniors is because of drug abusers? Um, I'm saying it's because of the, well, I would say it differently. I'm saying it's because of the federalization of the expense for treatment of the chronically mentally ill and drug abusers in what had previously been fully state or state and county funded service programs. Um, the other piece of that, just to finish up, in some states, in my own New York, um, it's been a big issue. In other states, it's been a much smaller issue, has been that's where most, um, the, the plurality, not the majority, but the plurality of all services in the United States for people with AIDS and HIV infection is in that box. And of course, that's an 80s phenomenon in terms of the growth of those numbers. I think there are a number of issues like that. It probably many of these would range in the optional areas. You earlier you raised, uh, raised uh, dental services. Uh, my wife was an occupational uh, therapist. I think there are a lot of things that may indeed may be meritorious, but that's where the flexibility at the states and a lot of that burden should, should fall, uh, and that there may be other ways as we move through a lot of these things in the future we can work out some relationships where I think the federal government has moved way too far, and even if everything isn't block granted, there may be some kind of rainy day fund to protect the highest risk in the, in the health areas, but there's a lot of ranges. I think it's a, a matter of some decision at the states and how they want to deal with alcohol and drug abuse, too. I don't think that should necessarily be a national mandate. Well, again, I think um, we agree that there are, if you start from the presumption of the basic, you know, that upper left-hand corner, sir, is one way of describing it. There are a lot of ways to give the states greater flexibility, both in administration of that part of the program and in the way they run the rest of the program. Mr. Vladek, I just have two, two general uh, questions, and then I appreciate it. I know you need to get on your way, and it, we're going to get you on your way a little earlier than you, your bottom line final requirement was. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you had mentioned to, to me talking about Connecticut as an example of uh, repeals the requirement that all communities in the state receive comparable benefits, that whole issue. Let me just introduce the other side of the story. The, the federal government on high's decision that the state has to offer the same levels of service everywhere uh, prevents uh, a state, particularly say like Illinois, a larger state, uh, it basically says that it can't offer an innovative program, let's say in the Chicago area, because it's not provided in southern Illinois, well, because it's not a comparable service. And to me, uh, this is kind of the illustration of why I'd like the federal government out of it. Because if people live in Chicago and you can provide a better service because it's available, why should we do it? Why should we basically downgrade the benefit to, to Chicago because it's not available say, in southern Illinois. State's not required to make it available, sir. If there's one super-duper children's specialist in the state of Illinois and he practices a children's hospital in Chicago, the state is, and, and he's the only one who does I'm that I'm not operation. talking about the super-duper. Well, but let's, um, but I think if, if you look at the practical issues, if we're talking about um, tailoring um, home and community-based services to the particular needs of communities in some communities and rural communities, you can't run a decent long-term care program without providing people with yeah. transportation in the city of Chicago. Um, you may be able to rely on public transportation. Well, I'm I'm talking uh, that flexibility is permitted. Well, but what's not permitted under current law is to say that in s downstate Illinois, we are going to provide uh, Medicaid beneficiaries with dental care, and we're not going to provide it to the Medicaid beneficiaries in the, state of well, Chicago, in the city of Chicago. Yeah. And, and we think there's a good historical basis for that requirement. Yeah, I know there's been a historical basis, that, but, but there, thank God we don't do everything on a historical basis. Um, but what I'm thinking of is in terms of just the whole concept of introducing managed care. Um, 
and the ability of a community to provide managed care in one area that they may not be able to provide it in some other part we, of the we state. We don't require that states that do managed care in one community do it everywhere. No, no, but there you give waivers. And, and, We've and, proposed in our legislation see, that not and, require and see, waiver. And one of the obscene things, as far as I'm concerned, is that a state even has to go to the federal government on bended knee to ask to do a, be able to do managed care. I mean, managed care is a pretty basic kind of program. It doesn't have to come to the federal government to ask to do man managed care if it limits enrollment to voluntary enrollment on perhaps beneficiaries. Right. If it wants to require beneficiaries to enroll in managed care, then under current law it requires a waiver from the federal government. And we've proposed eliminating that and yeah. permitting mandatory managed care without such a waiver. Okay. Um, you know what, in some ways I think you are, have the same challenge on, on Medicaid that we have now with our budget. We don't have a budget and so we're having to, and we may not end up with a budget until next year. And so we're having to decide what government programs we keep running, and we're having to work night and day to say, my God, we want this one to run, but maybe not this one. And that's kind of an archaic system, but it's the best we got on the table right now. And you all are having to decide uh, what are all these things in this book that we can drop soon enough before some of us, uh, you know, point another problem with it. It would be a lot simpler, I think, to scrap the damn thing and, and to just be logical about Yes, managed care, for instance, do it and, and, and not have to ask permission. And I understand the distinction you make, requiring or not requiring. I happen to believe that uh, if, the federal, if, if the American people are paying the bill, they should have some requirement. Nobody has to. Using your concept, no welfare recipient is forced to join a health care system that is provided totally and completely by the taxpayer. And using your concept of it's optional. Well, I'm obviously I'm I don't want to. No, it is. It's optional. They don't have to, right? No yes. AFD student has to take health care. They choose to, correct? They choose to. I think the taxpayers have a right to say, you know what? If you want free health care, you're going to do it in a program we think is is good, cost effective, and saves money at the time. And there we would have another, another disagreement. No, but, I, we agree with you, sir. Okay. Okay, so you would agree that the state should be allowed to? Yes, sir. That's part of the president's proposal. But the f okay, but I thought you said the federal law was that we had the to existing law. Okay. Yeah. I thank you very much for being here, thank and you, um, I welcome our next witnesses. You've been a wonderful sir, sir, witness. I'll try to get to that additional yeah. information as soon as we can. And again, Mr. Laddick, thank you for trying to arrange the schedule of, of others. And uh, before I thank oh, I'm you, sorry. yeah, we're all set. I just want to make sure um, I have the opportunity to have read Mr. Waxman's statement. It's very interesting. <laughs> And um, Mr. Towns is, and um, without objection, um, uh, all records will be, uh, their statements will be on the record. And um, obviously, any of uh, the full statements of our witnesses without objection will be as well. Thank you for reminding me of that. Okay, you, you've been very helpful. You, Wonderful to have you help. Uh, let me give you back, let me give you back this. I mean, I can't keep that? Yeah, it's excellent, yeah. Okay, but it's been, it's excellent. Our third panel is, uh, is, is comprised of one individual, uh, William Scanlon, who is the Associate Director, uh, Health Finance Issues, General Accounting Office, the GAO Office. It's funny, if someone said General Accounting Office, I wouldn't know what it was, but GAO I do. Let me, um, if you would, stay standing and swear you in, and uh, love to hear your testimony. Pardon me. Uh, would you please identify... Richard Jensen as well, who's a Medicaid specialist. Richard, wonderful to have you here. And if both of you stay standing and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. We're very pleased to be here today as the subcommittee considers the issue of mandates in the Medicaid program. Um, and I'm, we're happy to report on work that we've done on Medicaid programs in various states over uh, the recent months. Between 1984 and 1993, the Congress has enacted a series of provisions that mandated coverage primarily for low-income pregnant women, children, and Medicare beneficiaries, and allowed states to cover other groups at their discretion. These provisions have been detailed in an appendix to my written statement. During the decade, Medicaid enrollment increased more than 50% as 11 million persons were added to the rolls. At the same time, the federal coverage mandates and state optional coverage decisions 
led to considerably greater uniformity across states in the proportion of low-income individuals covered by Medicaid. These mandates, however, also contributed to sharp increases in Medicaid spending. In the last decade, Medicaid spending more than tripled and grew faster than most major items in the federal budget, including Medicare. Enrollment mandates, however, were not the sole contributor to the rise in Medicaid spending. Depending upon the time period you examine, other factors such as medical price inflation, utilization growth, and increases in eligibles due to a national recession contributed significantly as well. From 1988 through 1991, higher enrollment, inflation, and increased use of services each accounted for about a third of the expenditure growth. In 1991 and 1992, however, it was states use of dish payments, those supplemental payments to hospitals that serve a large number of Medicaid and other low income patients that were the most important cost driver. In two years, dish payments grew from just under $1 billion to over $17 billion and represented about one out of every $7 Medicaid spent on medical services. Today, in response to these rising costs, many states have or are seeking flexibility to control Medicaid spending through greater use of managed care. Their program restructuring efforts mirror private health payers' growing reliance on managed care plans to provide care at a, at a hopefully lower cost by control, controlling the price and use of services. Medicaid, however, still lags well behind the private sector in the use of managed care. The Medicaid statute, adopted at a time when fee-for-service medicine was predominant, limits states' ability to use managed care. States can enroll their Medicaid beneficiaries, as was discussed, in managed care only by seeking waivers of program rules. And to make the most extensive use of managed care, a state must seek a Section 1115 waiver to operate their program as a demonstration or experiment. Section 1115 waivers provide states uh, the ability to contract with a broader range of managed care organizations, including those that enroll few or no private patients. Usually, to serve Medicaid beneficiaries, 25% of a managed care organization's enrollment must be private paying patients, as the plan's ability to attract private patients was seen as one assurance of quality. Similarly, Section 1115 waivers also permit states to require beneficiaries to remain enrolled in managed care for up to a year rather than, to, than 30 days, which is usually required by Medicaid. The freedom of beneficiaries to disenroll at will has also been seen as an indirect assurance of quality of care. While HICFA has agreed to waive some of the traditional quality assurance provisions, the terms and conditions of Section 1115 waivers require states to operate alternative quality assurance systems. Beneficiary protections are essential in our view because of the financial incentives to underserve in managed care plans that are paid and are themselves paying providers on a per capita rather than a per service basis. While almost half the states are currently engaged in or planning a transformation of their programs, we believe an important lesson has emerged from our observations of these state experiences. That is, while broader use of managed care holds the promise of better cost containment and access for Medicaid beneficiaries, it also presents considerable planning and implementation challenges. In my written statement, we provide information on the experiences of three states that we have examined, Arizona, Tennessee, and Oregon. Let me focus briefly on Arizona. Today, Arizona's program includes the development and use of competitive market forces to select health care providers and determine capitation rates. Its effective use of competitive bidding has resulted in considerable savings to both the state and the federal governments. In addition, it has developed the data collection and analysis capabilities needed to monitor plans, provision of services, and financial performance. These accomplishments, however, did not occur overnight. Arizona encountered early implementation difficulties, but has been expending and, re and refining its program management efforts since it began its managed care program in 1982. The maturity of Arizona's program today, especially its oversight mechanisms, reflects the substantial preparation and development efforts that the state invested over many years. In conclusion, I would note that consistent with the interest of the Congress in containing federal spending, States believe they need greater flexibility to manage their respective Medicaid programs. Flexibility available today only by seeking federal permission with a waiver. If states are granted more direct control to aggressively pursue managed care strategies, 
the importance of adequate implementation, planning, and continuous oversight of managed care systems to protect both Medicaid beneficiaries from inappropriate denial of services and federal dollars from payment abuses must not be overlooked. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or others may have. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Uh, Sc Scanlon, correct. Scanlon, right. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Scanlon. Mr. Scanlon, um, first, thank you for your good work and uh, the good work of your agency. And second, let me just um, uh, ask you about um, the process, uh, the waiver process. What is the basic uh, length of time that's required uh, to get a waiver? Uh, the length of time has varied uh, considerably. So the admin as Mr. Vladek indicated, the administration has been, uh, or an earlier witness indicated that the, the administration indicated some flexibility um, when it came into office in terms of the process of approving waivers. Right. Um, and in fact, the, the state of Tennessee um, submitted a waiver in 1993 uh, and qu received quite sort of rapid approval and began sort of their program um, sort of only uh, approximately two months after they, they received sort of waiver approval. Um, in fact, sort of what, um, from our observations of Tennessee, sort of that rapid implementation ended up sort of being relatively short-sighted in terms of the kinds of problems that resulted in, in, in stemming from confusion over to exactly sort of how the managed care system was going to operate in the state. And it seemed to sort of lead to a more careful um, and more deliberate consideration of sort of waiver applications on the, on the part of the administration. So that our understanding now is that it's taking closer to, um, I, would, uh, I don't have a good average, but I would say it's cl um, closer to a year before a sort of a waiver is, in, is approved. Now, the, the, purpose, the reason why states need a waiver is that the federal government has various requirements that they no longer want to be uh, come under. That's correct. The, the two, the, the most important requirements are that one cannot mandate that persons enroll in managed care organizations without a waiver, that only, uh, without a waiver one can only uh, make managed care of, um, organizations available as a state option right. and allow people to voluntarily enroll. And the second major requirement that states feel impedes their use of managed care is the fact that you cannot have a managed care, cannot contract with a managed care organization that has fewer than 25 percent private patients. Correct. Uh, and that last one creates what problems? It creates uh, a number of problems. For states that have um, very limited amounts of managed care in the private sector, it means that they are handicapped and that there are no organizations to go to where they won't become immediately the dominant purchaser of um, services and that, they're, that they're, the Medicaid enrollees will not represent sort of more than 75 percent um, of the enrollment. Uh, it also means that you are potentially at a, um, a disadvantage in t terms of dealing with organizations that are not serving the areas of states that are uh, where Medicaid beneficiaries live, such as inner cities. You could have managed care organizations in a large urban area that are really oriented towards sort of the major businesses of that area and have their services located more in the suburban fringe and you don't have sort of the enough services in the inner city. If a managed care organization is to organize and to go into um, that area, it may end up with more than 100, more than 75 percent Medicaid patients and, that, and would under the existing rules be prohibited from participating in the program. How, um, how long have you been in the position, not necessarily in, your, in, in this position, but how long have you uh, done research on Medicare or Medicaid? How long have you been involved in that area? I've been involved since 1975 in doing health services research, primarily on Medicaid um, and uh, somewhat on Medicare. Okay. What are some of the challenges that we have in the billing system of Medicaid? What? I'm just talking in terms of being able to catch the waste, the fraud, the abuse, and so on. Where, where do the challenges lie? Well, we, our challenges have changed considerably over time um, it, because of the fact that we have, have um, uh, had a great improvement in the data processing capacity that's available to states. Um, one, um, when in dealing in a fee-for-service world um, and it's having uh, claims for services come in from all different types of providers, 
one has to be concerned about the ability to, to gather those claims together, match them up for an individual, and see whether or not the pattern of service use um, is appropriate. Um, that kind of challenge is now much more feasible to deal with with, with modern data and processing capacity. Um, I, one of the things that we have not looked at at GAO um, recently is the states of how much the states have been able to adopt sort of that modern data processing capacity to be able to do that kind of an activity. When one talks about managed care, you face a whole different set of challenges with respect to fraud and abuse because the state is no longer the direct payer of each individual service. The state is the payer of a per capita payment to each managed care organization, leaving the managed care organization responsible for delivering the appropriate package of services. Now, while you're concerned about whether or not they allow providers to bill for abusive or unnecessary services, that's one issue. You're also concerned about the managed care organization making sure that the package of services being delivered is adequate. And so, therefore, we've all, we have regarded it as critical that the states put themselves in a position of being able to get sufficient information about the services managed care organizations um, deliver, primarily by having them report in counter data to the state and that the state have the capacity to analyze it. This has been one of the biggest challenges that states have faced in moving toward more managed care. As I indicated, Arizona has been reasonably successful in getting that information from their managed care organizations using it effectively to monitor care as well as using it in their competitive bidding process. The other two states which have got, had mo recently moved very significantly into managed care, Oregon and Tennessee, have been less successful um, to date in trying to work with encounter data. Both of those states have two years of experience and have yet to have their systems operational and, uh, and effective to the point of being able to monitor the kinds of uh, care that are being delivered. Have you done much or any or much work in Medicare? I've done a, a, a moderate amount. Okay. What are the differences and what are the challenges in trying to get at the waste and the fraud and the abuse in Medicare versus Medicaid? Is there, are there parallels or are they very different? I think there are, there are some parallels in terms of um, the, the, when one is operating in a fee-for-service environment, there is always the issue of claims coming in from multiple providers um, and that really when the most important type of, uh, or the most uh, prevalent type of abuse that can be identified is the issue of excessive volumes of services and duplicative services. Medicaid programs typically have had one bill payer um, for their programs, and so that all the bills for the Medicaid program are flowing to one contractor who can then process them and presumably put together the profiles to be able to identify abusive practices. With Medicare, we have had divided responsibility um, in terms of the payment of bills. We have intermediaries dealing with institutional services, the Part A services, and we have carriers dealing with um, the Part B, sort of primarily the physician, sort of, and some um, other, other services. And so you have, have claims flowing into two different entities. Um, sometimes you actually, um, from an area, you'll have more than one intermediary involved with different providers, sort of, in an area. So you have information flowing to um, uh, different parts of the country to be processed. And the, the collection of that information and the profiling to, in order to be able to identify abuses is a challenging task. The Medicare transaction system is uh, a planned attempt to try and deal with that issue. Um, but it's, it's uh, the fact that we're moving in that direction is positive. The fact that we're not there is, is disappointing. What's the um, one, what would be uh, the, um, what concerns would you have with block grants? I mean, wh if you were looking at it as an agency, what, what becomes your concern if this becomes a block granted program to the states? Well, I, th I think we believe that uh, very strongly that for managed care to succeed and sort of and, and more um, vigorous cost control efforts to succeed, we have to be successful in assuring that an adequate uh, level of care is being provided to the population um, in need. And from our observation of state experiences, 
we would um, suggest that it's not necessarily a question of will in terms of how difficult a challenge this is and in terms of how states may encounter difficulties in assuring that there is an adequate level of care being provided. But it's just a difficult challenge. And that what we as an agency would hope is that there be enough assistance and enough attention devoted to the question of how, it, how do we overcome the implementation problems that states are going to face um, and how do we continue to monitor to ensure that adequate care is being provided so that we don't have the negative feedback that, that would occur um, if, if care turned out to be inadequate and have a backlash against the kinds of efficiency gains that we were, we've been trying to achieve. So you know you have the efficiency gains. The concern would be uh, whether there would be, um, the, the, the needs of the individual would be, would be met. Your comment, though, is, is well taken. If they weren't, there would be a backlash. Right. Um, and we would like them to be efficiency gains as, just the, as opposed to pure cost savings, because cost savings can come either from efficiency gains, which means you're saving money producing an acceptable product, or cost savings can come because we've reduced the amount of services and, and in fact, we've abused the, the per capita yeah. payment. We've, we've siphoned off too much of it into profit and uh, payments uh, for unne unnecessary pr provider um, incomes. Um, that, that caused me to just follow up one last question. I hope I don't think of another one last question. Um, is it your sense that there is a lot of efficiency gains to be made? Given that Medicaid is still uh, predominantly a fee-for-service system, I think that it, there are considerable efficiency gains um, to be made. We are seeing, I think, in the private sector as well as in the states that are moving to managed care um, with their Medicaid programs, that there is an ability to negotiate discounts further discounts with providers, and that there is an ability to affect the utilization of services. Um, we don't know how far we can go, um, and we have to worry about how far uh, it goes in terms of whether we affect the quality of care that's being provided. Um, but it would seem that, given the incentives of the fee-for-service system were to overprovide, as we change those incentives, we have the opportunity to gain some efficiencies through more appropriate provision. And I'm going to capture this thought as, as, as it's my own after a, a, a few days. Your concept of efficiency gains versus? Simple cost savings. Okay. Yeah. The cost savings you would define as not necessarily providing the same level of service, therefore, therefore, thereby saving uh, money. So, and that really, I think, helps define the debate. I mean, if the administration thinks there are going to be cost savings and that's what ultimately results, then, then they may be right. If, if we find that by having the states do it, we see significant efficiency gains by doing it, then, then, then we would tend to be right. And uh, obviously, that's where the debate is. It's a nice way to focus the debate for me, so I thank you. Yeah. Mr. Souter? <coughs> and I'm sorry if I go over a point that you covered when I was out. Um, in the computer question, which we've talked about in the um, uh, Medicare before too, as well as today in the Medicaid, is the inability to contract that out do more because the input data, a plan, uh, why is this not something that would overlap with some of what private sector people may do already? Well, I think it's a uh, an issue of a challenge on on both sides, both the state side as well as the managed care organizations. Um, Historically, health maintenance organizations have not had to submit s claims for services because they were being paid a capitated fee and they were not being paid on an individual service basis and so there were no claims um, for each individual service. Um, getting the kind of encounter data or service data that really is needed to monitor um, these plans um, is the equivalent of getting data on individual services or individual claims. And so you, the managed care organizations themselves have to have the capacity to be able to submit those claims. And I think that's one issue. Another issue on their part is that they have to submit all that information in a common format so that states can work with it. Um, and having worked with claims data myself in the past, I know that when you're getting data from multiple sources, even though it's, cons it's purportedly in similar formats, it's often a challenge to get it um, to be truly compatible and to uh, integrate it to be able to be used for um, analysis. 
The second thing is I think that the states are in a different position now in terms of what they need to do with those data once they get them. In the past, they simply had to pay claims, uh, calculate some aggregate statistics so that they were able to report to HICFA and to be able to monitor their program in an aggregate way. Now they need to know more about what is the care like that's being delivered. They need to get down to the individual and to be able to ask questions about the adequacy of care. And how to do that is a challenge that not only the states are facing and the, and the public sector, but the private sector as well. And there's promising um, work going on in that area, both in the academic community in, and in the provider community, um, in terms of identifying things that could be used as markers of good care. Um, there's a group of um, markers called ambulatory care sensitive conditions, someone that has diabetes. Um, if their diabetes is being well managed, they shouldn't necessarily be hospitalized. And so if you see hospitalizations among your diabetic patients, um, then you know that maybe perhaps they're not getting adequate ambulatory care. Those kind of markers, they're in their infancy, and we need to work a lot to develop those so that we have relatively comprehensive measures of the adequacy of care. So it's, a, it's both an issue of a transition, uh, to this new system and trying to deal with the problems of the transition as well as it's an issue of development of a new science to be able to monitor care. Um, one other uh, question. You submitted a list of the major expansions of Medicaid eligibility uh, over this uh, period of 84 to 93. And when you read the list, there's I mean, no person in government or anybody in politics or any really sensitive individual would ever want to vote against any of these. They all sound uh, really, I mean, uh, somebody who's pregnant, pregnancy, something pregnancy related uh, co requires coverage of a family income and resources are below state levels regardless of family structure. Um, and, and a lot of things that sound really important, but when you accumulate them together, uh, that's how you bankrupt a government. Um, what my concern was at the beginning here, and maybe you gave this figure, as you said it, that you thought 50 50 percent of the uh, uh, recipients were because of the additions in 84 to 93. Is that roughly true? Of the well, there was about a 50 percent increase in the number of recipients during the decade in which all of those were enacted. So that Some of that increase is not due just to um, those mandates um, or, or the optional provisions for, uh, that are at state discretion. There's also pop the issue of population growth um, in that period. As well as, by the end of that decade, we just happened to be in the midst of a national recession. And we know that recessions, when increases in unemployment, add considerably to the Medicaid rolls. Um, we have not, I haven't seen an analysis that uh, tries to separate the mandates, per se, from um, the recession and from population growth. Because uh, some of the mandates may ha ever have added costs to those who were already on the rolls, too. Is that That's not? correct. So, in reality, it, it could be either more or less than 50, depending on the impact of recession versus what they added to people who were already on the list. Right. The mandates, we um, believe, that had its biggest impact in terms of number of recipients. However, the mandates, for the most part, added persons to the roles who were less expensive to serve because they were adding primarily women and children and, to a certain extent, Medicare eligibles who were being covered only for their Medicare cost sharing. So the dollars wouldn't the be. The dollars are not, or would not be the 50 percent number. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon, thank you very much. Did you have any uh, point, observation you'd like to make? I uh, think, uh, think your boss did a good job. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> I think he probably did a better job knowing you were by his right. side. So thank you. Thank you. Well, appreciate your good work. I appreciate your observations. It was uh, good to have your testimony, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are going to close with panel four. Um, William Beach, visiting fellow, the Heritage Foundation. Philip Dearborn, Director of Government Finance Research, Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations. And Judith uh, Fader, Professor, Institute for Healthcare Research, Georgetown University. You'd all, I'm sorry, I should have caught you before you sat down. If you'd all rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. For the record, um, note that all three uh, witnesses have responded in the affirmative. 
Um, you are our last panel, but um, you are equal to the others, and, and we appreciate it. And uh, the nice, uh, nice thing is I think a good number of you have been here for a while, and you might want to make observations on uh, points that were made before, which is always helpful as well. And um, pardon me? Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Beach, I'm being told by staff I have to start with you. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I'm accustomed, because of the spelling of my last name, to being at the top of the list. <laughs> well, uh, in that sense, uh, Mr. Dearborn, why don't we go, uh, go with you first? <laughs> <laughs> I want a, a little variety for you. I don't want you to always have to go first. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Philip Dearborn. I'm Director of Government Finance Research at the Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations. My testimony today is based on the role of federal mandates in intergovernmental relations a report required under the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995. In this report, ACIR reviewed 14 federal mandates to provide a basis for recommended changes in federal policies to improve intergovernmental relations. Final recommendations will be submitted to the President and Congress in March of this year. The Medicaid Boren Amendment is one of the 14 mandates identified by a survey of state and local governments that is reviewed in the preliminary report. The mandate itself, for an amendment, requires states to establish reimbursement rates to pay hospitals, nursing facilities, and intermediate care facilities for services provided to persons eligible for assistance through the Medicaid program. The mandated federal criteria provide that state-determined reimbursement rates must be reasonable and adequate to meet the costs which must be incurred by efficiently and economically operated facilities in order to provide care and services in conformity with applicable state and federal laws, regulations, and quality and safety standards. Now, as the chairman pointed out, the intent of the Boren Amendment was to give states a means of controlling costs related to reimbursement claims from providers of Medicaid services. Rather than merely being reimbursement on a cost-related payment requirement for hospitals and nursing home services, the amendment allows states to pay for services based on predetermined reimbursement rates, giving states a basis for denying reimbursement for costs determined to be in excess of that necessary to provide efficiently and economically delivered services. However, despite the good intention, the law is seen uh, by many states as more of a burden than a benefit. One problem is the vague, undefined terms used to describe the federally mandated criteria for reimbursement rates. And these include terms such as reasonable, adequate, efficiently, and economically. And because the intent was to provide flexibility, the federal government made a conscious decision not to issue regulations defining the vague terms in the statutory language. An additional complication is that while the law requires reimbursement rates to be determined in accordance with methods and standards developed by the state, it also requires the federal government to be satisfied with the state-determined rates. To implement this requirement, the federal government decided to require state processes for determining rates and the rates themselves to be a part of the state Medicaid plans. These plans are then subject to approval by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Well, what's happened is the vagueness of the statutory language, combined with the lack of regulatory definitions, has resulted in substantial litigation, with some courts viewing the Boren Amendment as a cost-based payment standard in which all costs incurred by the providers must be reimbursed. In these instances, states may be liable for significant sums to cover the retroactive rate increases ordered by the court for the group of providers involved in the suit. In some cases, these additional payments uh, made as a result of court-ordered retroactive uh, rate increases are not eligible even for federal matching payments. Much of the Boren Amendment litigation, however, does not relate to the vagueness of the statutory language, but rather it relates to uh, a state's procedure for determining these reimbursement rates. If the, in such cases, if the procedure is ruled by a court to be flawed due to lack of adequate public notice, or other factors, a state may be liable for substantial retroactive reimbursement rates based on revised determination procedures. And again, the federal government may or may not share in the cost of the retroactive payments. Now, we understand that the Department of Health and Human Services, in response to this problem, 
has tightened its process for reviewing the state rate determination procedures uh, so that the, uh, the potential acceptance by the courts will be, uh, they hope, better than it has been in, in many instances in the past. The state concerns, of course, are that, that uh, they feel a Boron Amendment handcuffs their ability to constrain the growth in Medicaid spending during times of fiscal crisis requiring that Medicaid reimbursement rates be established within the limits of federally mandated criteria, restricts the scope of states' rate negotiations with providers of medical and nursing home services, and this potential litigation often causes a state to increase rates merely to avoid the legal action that might be forthcoming. States are concerned about the extensive and expensive work necessary to substantiate compliance with the law and to protect protect against suits by nursing home or hospital providers. This situation is especially true since the 1990 Supreme Court ruling in Wilder against Virginia Hospital Association. In that suit, the Supreme Court declared that medical care providers, instead of the re Medicaid recipients, are the intended beneficiaries of the Boren Amendment. This ruling allows medical facilities and nursing homes to obtain judicial review of state reimbursement rates under the Civil Rights Act, Section 1983. In effect, the court ruling allows hospitals and nursing homes to claim that a state is violating the hospital's civil rights by failing to pay cost incurred to provide services. Preliminary recommendation of the ACIR is that because states are traditionally responsible for the quality and safety of medical services, and Medicaid is a state-administered program, States should be allowed to conduct reimbursement rate ne negotiations with Medicaid service providers without preconditions set by federal law. Therefore, the ACIR preliminary recommendation is to repeal the language of the Boren Amendment and insert language making states solely responsible for determining, determining Medicaid reimbursement rates. In concluding, I want to emphasize that my testimony, including the conclusions and recommendations regarding the Boren Amendment, are based on the ACIR preliminary report and are subject to change based on final decisions of the Commission after receipt and review of public comments. The Commission will hold a conference discussion for discussion of its preliminary report on March 6th and 7th and will receive public comments over the next two months before issuing its final report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Professor Fader, I'd love to hear your testimony. Nice to know that the voice behind the nodding of the head or the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I, I said one thing, you went, what? I apologize, and I appreciated no, no. very much your correcting the record. Uh, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm glad to be here today in general to uh, talk about the uh, Medicaid program. Um, I have been impressed in listening to the discussion this afternoon uh, at how much agreement there is about the need for enhanced flexibility in the program. I think that there is very little disagreement on the uh, key issues that have received so much attention, the managed care, uh, home care, the Boren Amendment, as the uh, preceding speaker indicated. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, where the disagreement lies is whether to retain uh, what I believe is the specification of what the purpose of the program and the federal funds are, and that is the guarantee of insurance coverage uh, for the eligible population. To briefly summarize my views, uh, I think it is reasonable to argue that le legislative change can enhance Medicaid's efficiency, as uh, Dr. Scanlon described it earlier, and can generate savings in pursuing the program's fundamental purpose of insurance protection for vulnerable populations. And that that is, in fact, the approach that has been taken in the administration's proposal for flexibility and a cap on per beneficiary, the growth in federal payments per beneficiary, uh, referred to as the per capita cap. In contrast, the conference agreement and subsequent proposals uh, from the Re Republicans that would eliminate the entitlement to coverage and would reduce federal funds would not, dramatically, would not provide flexibility in pursuit of that coverage goal. Rather, they would abandon the insurance guarantee that actually defines the Medicaid program. Block grants with limited funds put states willing to sustain coverage at greatest risk. Under these proposals, coverage can be sustained only if states increase spending to offset federal reductions. If instead, states spend the minimum needed to draw down their allocation of federal funds, insurance coverage of the population would be dramatically undermined. 
Let me elaborate briefly. First, as we heard from Dr. Vladek, uh, the HICFA administrator, uh, Medicaid is a, a voluntary federal state partnership. Under the program, the federal fund government makes matching funds available to states to operate the medical assistance programs consistent with federal guidelines. State participation is voluntary, and the guidelines aim to assure the intended use of federal funds. The most important of these guidelines define Medicaid as an insurance program. That is, they define the population that must or may be insured and specify the health and long-term care benefits that must or may be covered. People who satisfy Medicaid eligibility criteria have a legally enforceable right to coverage for a defined set of benefits. That means that Medicaid beneficiaries, like people with private insurance, know what will be paid for when they get sick. States can decide whether or not they wish to participate in the Medicaid program, but if they choose to participate, they are choosing to provide meaningful insurance coverage to a defined population. Under current law, as Dr. Vladek indicated and you discussed extensively, states already have considerable flexibility in satisfying this requirement. Um, as we saw, only 38% of total Medicaid spending is for populations and services that states are required as distinct from having the option to cover. Now, when you consider legislation to reduce Medicaid spending, it is critical to preserve Medicaid as an insurance program. The administration's proposal preserves the insurance protections of Medicaid while promoting greater efficiency in their pursuit. The proposal would uh, provide states the flexibility and service delivery they have been seeking specifically with respect to managed care and the negotiation and provider payment, and I would add to that the home care and long-term care in, uh, that we were discussing earlier today. And I, as I said, I think those are the fu three fundamental uh, of the flexibilities that were, act were emphasized. Both managed care and provider payment changes will facilitate state efforts to provide insurance protection at lower cost, satisfying the definition of efficiency that you discussed earlier. The administration further promotes these results with the additional action of establishing a limit on the rate of growth in federal payments per beneficiary enrolled in the program. The per capita cap has three fundamental characteristics. First, by focusing on expenditures per beneficiary rather than total expenditures, it encourages states to focus on efficiency in coverage, not eliminating coverage in slowing cost growth. Second, by allowing funds to increase as the number of beneficiaries increases, it sustains the health insurance safety net and protects states against increased demands for coverage that come with economic recession or demographic changes, developments that are unpredictable and from which no state is immune. Third, by establishing a growth rate for federal funds that recognizing, recognizes rising general costs and medical costs, it protects states and beneficiaries against the erosion of purchasing power as prices rise, thereby sustaining the value of insurance protection. Far from constituting an unfunded mandate, these features establish appropriate constraints on federal spending while continuing to assure states the availability of sufficient federal funds to meet their population's need for insurance protection. At the same time, they demonstrate that fiscal responsibility does not require the abandonment of social commitments. The combination of flexibility and the per capita cap in the administration proposal would promote efficiency in pursuing the long established and widely valued goal of the Medicaid program, insurance protection for vulnerable populations. In contrast, block grants that eliminate entitlements are not focusing on efficient insurance protection, they are eliminating the guarantee of insurance coverage. The conference agreement repealed the Medicaid program and replaced it with a block grant that eliminates fundamental insurance guarantees, provides states insufficient funds to cover the population that is eligible under current law, and leaves states at risk for recession, demographic change, and price increases. This is not a proposal to promote flexibility or efficiency. It is an abdication of federal responsibility to protect the nation's most vulnerable populations. The conference agreement would eliminate the fundamental elements of Medicaid as insurance, legally enforceable national criteria for who is covered for what benefits. 
At the same time, it would dramatically reduce by 17 percent over seven years the federal funds available to provide that protection. In other words, states would have neither the obligation nor the resources and ability to sustain current protection. Under the conference agreement, federal funds for the Medigrant program would increase at an average 4.8 percent per year from 1996 to 2002 in the aggregate. This growth rate is well below the 6 percent per year needed to keep with estimated beneficiary growth at roughly 3 percent per year and general inflation about 3 percent per year. Looked at another way, if states were to retain coverage provided under current law, the Urban Institute estimates they would have to constrain expenditure growth per beneficiary to 1.3 percent, less the, than half the rate of general price inflation. Even the modifications that have been proposed to increase funding under the conference agreement have failed to assure a per capita growth rate that is sufficient to keep up with medical cost inflation. To achieve this goal, the agreement provides no flexibilities in service delivery beyond those that are in the administration proposal, nor is it clear that any such flexibilities exist that could sustain coverage with such limited resources. Rather, what is allowed under that proposal is a safety valve to states that undermines this program's fundamental purpose, and that is the ability to eliminate coverage. That means that poor families, people with disabilities, and senior citizens would lose essential and health and long-term care protection. The conference agreement's threat to coverage goes beyond its reduction in federal dollars. As we've heard earlier, by changing the matching formula and other current Medicaid provi provisions, it allows states to substitute the limited pool of federal funds for the expenditure of state dollars. The Urban Institute estimates that if states reduce their spending to the minimum amount needed to draw down their allowed federal payments, total spending on medical assist assistance would fall an additional 8 percent beyond the 17 percent reduction that I already noted, a total of 25.4 percent or $400 billion over 1996 to 2002. No amount of flexibility can sustain coverage in light of such expenditure reductions. Coverage could be sustained only if states were actually to increase their spending in order to offset federal reductions. Furthermore, fixed dollar federal grants that do not vary with changing economic or demographic conditions that increase enrollment leave states fully at risk for such changes. Estimates prepared by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities indicate that a recession could increase the costs associated with Medicaid coverage by seven to twenty-six billion dollars over seven years. <clears throat> Under a block grant, all that risk would be borne by the states. Rather than enhancing states' ability to manage their programs, the major thrust of the conference agreement is to leave states holding the fiscal bag for protecting vulnerable Americans. Expecting states to bear such risks in order to preserve co coverage is not only unrealistic, it would indeed represent the unfunded mandate that its proponents profess to avoid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to enjoy our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mr. Beach. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank you as all the witnesses and thank this committee for the opportunity to come before you and share re research we have done. I, I must say that uh, the two points, this has been a, an extraordinary seminar on this whole subject. I've learned a lot this afternoon, as I'm sure everyone who's spent the whole afternoon with you has learned. It's and nice of you to say that. It's, a, it's a, been an interesting hearing, and you've helped make it that way as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate also being on the last panel, though that's not normally the position one wants to be if one has other things one wants to do. Uh, because I think the testimony that, that I've heard from my fellow witnesses and the testimony I'm about to give you uh, puts an exclamation point on what went before our, our panel. Let me summarize my main point in a paper which has been distributed prior to this, this committee and which I'm not going to read and I'm just going to ask you to look at at your convenience. The main point of the work that the Heritage Foundation has done on this particular subject is that if we assume that Medicaid remains a program of guaranteed health care for federally defined covered groups, that's our first assumption, and secondly, that states are largely prohibited from making significant changes to the program that would reduce its costs beyond their current efforts. And I 
make that assumption, perhaps underline that beyond their current efforts then. It is highly likely that states will need to raise substantial new tax revenues or make major cuts in other programs, such as education, economic development, and highway construction, in order to meet their Medicaid obligations. Now, we, we came at this problem, Mr. Chairman, uh, statistically. What we wanted to do was to develop uh, 51 estimates, if, if you will, of what the states are facing over a seven-year period in terms of their obligation for meeting current law as well as the proposed Blue Dog or per capita cap program. So we constructed 51 state statistical or economic models, that is, all the states plus the District of Columbia, and we found that failing to fundamentally change the Medicaid program as it's now defined may mean that states will need to raise over this seven-year period out of their own resources, an additional $146 billion in order to meet their current obligations under the current program. Uh, secondly, to restress my earlier point, that these additional dollars for Medicaid may mean that states will need to raise new taxes or cut spending in other programs. Uh, if I could just say, I think this afternoon we haven't heard enough on that latter point, and that is that at the state level, the debates aren't just in do we cover this group or do we cover that group or do we provide this level of service? The debates rather in the legislatures are do we support higher growth in higher education or do we meet these obligations as they're currently defined? They're between the program categories. And uh, thirdly, that moving to a per capita cap program that reduces federal Medicaid program dollars may mean that states will need to raise an additional $47 billion in order to pay for their uh, portion or obligations. Um, now, very briefly, uh, how did we develop these estimates? Because I think I'd like to put a pedigree on these numbers. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, as you may or may not know, is from time to time a critic of large government and has said from time to time that we tax too much. So in doing these estimates... From time to time, give me a break. <laughs> All the time. Well, uh, That's what most, you say. Most of the time. Okay. Um, uh, so to... Uh, to make sure that these estimates had as little uh, uh, content in them as possible, uh, we turned to one of the nation's foremost uh, econometric um, houses, uh, consulting companies, the Wharton Econometric Forecasting Associates in Philadelphia, more particularly Bala Kenwood. Uh, working with them, we created three sets of models. Uh, the first was a set of 51 models of the total Medicaid program at the state level, and these equations, if you will, include, among other things, variables for the relevant demographic groups that are covered by Medicaid and variables for gauging the health or not the health of the state's economies. The second state, uh, set of models was a set of projections of total state revenues, and the third was a projection of total state expenditures. Uh, we took the baseline solutions from those models and adjusted them in order to reflect the size of the program that the Congressional Budget Office in December, I believe December 12, 1995, indicated that the Medicaid program would be at the federal level. Uh, the Heritage Foundation has made a point of always adopting the CBO forecast. A and, and finally, the additional state revenues required to pay for Medicaid, which you see on table number one of my testimony, over the next seven years were calculated by subtracting state Medicaid spending in 1995, which is in the bank, <clears throat> from what they may have to pay over the period 1996 through 2002. So our additional dollars are additional to 1995 total payments. Now, uh, a couple of observations about what I've put before you. Uh, first, I think it would be fair to characterize our projections as, quote, almost worst case, end quote. Uh, they're almost worst case for a couple of reasons, and not quite worst, worst case. Uh, first of all, we assume that the states would not make any additional efforts beyond what they're doing now to address Medicaid costs. Clearly, they'll be making additional efforts, but there has, there's a set of parameters in which they, or channel, in which they can make additional efforts, and that's been defined by previous testimony. Uh, secondly, because CBO Medicaid forecasts of December 1995 are based on economic projections that do not contain a recession, our estimate of $146 billion in additional state payments would certainly go up or grow if the economy experienced significant declines over the next seven years. 
And finally, the probability of slower growth and recession is certainly higher today than it was a month ago in light of the continued failure of the Congress and the administration to reach a seven-year balanced budget plan. I thank you very much, and uh, any questions you have, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Um, just trying to think of where we will begin here. Let me, um, Ms. Fader, let me, um, Professor Fader, let me ask you this question. Uh, when the President wants to make savings, do you call that a cut or a savings? And when Republicans want to make it a savings, do you call it a cut or a savings? I think that what we're talking about, as you indicated, with respect to both kinds of proposals, is cuts in rates of growth. Right, okay. the, uh, the question that, uh, that I think needs to be asked when we call it a uh, cut, it's, it's always federal savings. Uh, it's the always what? It's always going to be federal savings. The question is whether it is cutting the purchasing power that's associated with the program. Well, there are two issues. Uh, and I, if we could at least uh, kind of establish our, our, our ground rules. Uh, there is one question of whether we're actually spending more absolute dollars. And there's the other question, are we spending enough to keep up with the current program? No, well, and I would say there's a third, I guess, which is, which is whether we're spending an amount that is adequate to finance the, uh, the coverage that the program aims to provide. Well, at the current level of service. I mean, in other words, are we maintaining that current the level service. of service? Yeah. And it gets into this whole issue that the federal government started to do in the early 70s, and this is why I get sensitive to it. Our national debt has grown uh, since after World War II from about 430 billion in 19, excuse me, after the Vietnam War. Uh, in 1974, it was about 430 billion, a lot of money. Uh, and it is now 4,900 billion dollars. So since 74, to, uh, to now 96, we've seen a tenfold increase in our national debt. And my constituents, when I was first elected in 87, would say, what do you mean you keep telling me you're cutting spending when your budget keeps going up? And I thought, fair question. And because I kept caught talking about, well, we're cutting this pro spending this program, cutting, and yet the program kept going up. And, and I realized, as I obviously had to, that we were using, quote unquote, a baseline budget where we say, each year we add inflation, the new population, and whatever is taken from that, we in the federal government will call a cut. So constituents out there in the press dutifully report, we cut spending. No, we didn't cut spending, we spent more dollars. We may have, in fact, cut the program. Fair, fair question. So one of the debates that we're going to have, dialogue we're going to have here is, I would concede, if you could concede this point, one, we're spending more dollars, I would concede that, that under a baseline budget, if you spend less dollars than inflation plus the new population, that you are under existing program, you know, rules, you would be cutting that program. Is that fair? I think that's okay. fair. So one of the debates would, that, that I think we're going to have in this panel is going to be, um, we obviously want to change the program. And so the debate that we have with the White House on Medicaid, uh, our number was a savings to, uh, to the growth of about 133. My leadership dropped that number down to 85 savings. The White House is at 51. So yes, we're, my gosh, we're only uh, 34 billion apart in one sense. But we would contend that it's not just the number it is, are we going to change the program? And, and so that's where the debate will be. So I, you know, I, case closed. I mean, heck, if we don't make changes in the program, we got to spend exactly what that baseline budget tells us. And even the president's number of 51 billion will cut that program if we don't change the system. Well, and, I, and that's what I, why I, I began my testimony with the comment that I think that there is agreement on the need to change the system. The question then has to be asked, 
what can be expected in terms of reduced rates of growth from those changes and whether the level of continued funding is sufficient to provide the health care coverage, albeit in a, in a more efficient system, but whether it's sufficient to provide the coverage. And I think that it is there that the, uh, that the conference agreement and even the subsequent proposals fall down. Okay. Now, uh, when I've asked Ms. Fader, uh, either of you gentlemen are more than, uh, since she's provided a focal point of, of some disagreement, I may ask a question, but I'm more than happy to have either of you gentlemen jump in. So um, would you either care to make a comment on, on so far? I mean, the, the, are you basically content with this parameter of uh, we are spending more dollars, the question is are we spending enough? If we don't change the program, we aren't spending enough to keep up with the same level of service. If we change the program, then the question is, are we able to, to meet all of those program needs? In other words, and it gets me back to this issue of, of our, the previous uh, witness who basically talked about cost savings mm -hmm. versus efficiencies. No, that's, okay. that's, uh, I don't know too many people who would disagree that there needs to be, in some fashion or form, a program like this. Now, how we construct it and how we put it together to, uh, is, is, is the big issue. I, I would think we'd also want to bring into this another parameter no one's discussed today, perhaps it's not even relevant, and, and that is that we need to promote uh, in some way through public policy savings so that people can provide for these kinds of emergency care that, 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 that bring them to this point. And how do you promote savings among very, very poor people? You promote economic growth. And the level of economic growth we have now is so very much low that, I mean, it endangers the future of this, this program as much as it endangers the future of, of generations yet to come into the workforce. So these are all related questions. Well, it, it, which triggers the, a point again that I would throw out to the panel and, <coughs> and address to you, Ms. Fader. Uh, you make a point that the population growth requires 3% th more um, to, to meet the need of that population, plus an additional 3% for inflated health care costs. For, actually, that was general inflation. General inflation, okay. Uh, Medicaid is, in some cases, in some years, grown at 20% a year as we added more, quote unquote, voluntary programs, some mandatory programs. Uh, some years it's grown at less than that. Uh, we've been looking at a range of about 10 plus a year. Do you think it is conceivable that we could uh, maintain Medicare and Medicaid at a growth of 10 to 15 percent a year ad infinitum? Well, I think that, as we both indicated earlier, that there is some room to constrain the federal payments. But it is critical to me that they be done in a way that sustains the capacity for coverage and the commitment to coverage. And I think that that is the proposal. We're not talking about the status quo versus this. I just want to know where we have our agreements. I'm, I'm kind of like, you I'm, know. But, and, and, and we do have an agreement that some change, some restrictions okay. are, are possible and appropriate. I think that's, that's fine. But I wanted to ask. the White House and our leaders can't work out their disagreements. I want to know if we can in this informal. I don't way. know. We'll see. <laughs> the um, the, the a point I wanted to make about the growth rates over the years, uh, the, the very high, and they were in the, actually I think in some years even in the high 20% in the, in the early part of the 90s in Medicaid, uh, were only a, partly a function of expanded population. And that was I think about a third of the growth. Uh, and it was a commitment to cover low-income uh, pregnant women and children. Uh, a s sizable portion of that quite dramatic growth had to do with the, what was discussed earlier, the provider taxes and donations uh, and disproportionate share uh, payments. The disproportionate share materials. Yeah, and there were, and, and actually, I would call it perhaps some buck passing between the federal governments and the state governments. Well, on and if we could be candid here, um, and we are being candid, the other factor was that Congress devised this Grand Rudman that was going to control the growth of costs, and Grand Rudman only focused on savings in one third of the budget. It focused on discretionary spending. It didn't look at entitlements. And President Bush, right or wrong, with his budget agreement and some tax increases, was out to do one thing. He was out to say, if you expand an entitlement, you've got to come up with the money to pay for it, either with spending cuts somewhere else or a tax increase. That was part of the 1990 agreement. I voted for it. I know that was part of the agreement. And that was a, a concept of basically pay as you go. It was to get around Congress, which when it couldn't live within 
the discretionary spending, because we were capping spending under Grand Rudman, went and just kept loading entitlements. And, and so we candidly had to get at that. So, I mean, it, it, this, uh, they're, they're fascinating questions here. Mr. Dearborn, you basically spent most of your time on the Bourne Amendment. It, it appears from Mr. Vladek's uh, you know, emphasis that the, the White House wants to get at the Bourne Amendment. But they still want to leave a right of action in federal court. And my question mark is, and I guess maybe we don't have enough details to know, by getting rid of the Bourne Amendment in name, do we still have it? Uh, do we still have its ghost lingering in the courts? Because candidly, when Mr. Uh, Vladek was talking about nursing care uh, and no quote-unquote requirement of the federal government, uh, you both, in a sense, uh, directed your attention to the fact of regulation. You, in particular, the regulation, of the law not being defined by a regulation. Therefore, where is it being defined by? By the federal court. And the federal court, it's almost a little disingenuous to me to say that we don't have a federal requirement of so many nurses per patient when you have the federal government saying, since it's ambiguous, we're going to step in and we're going to start to s describe in the federal level what, what we need. So does anyone here have any information as to what, and I wish I had thought to ask Mr. Vladek this when he was here, so if you don't have the answer, I understand it. I, it will be something we'll pursue. Is there any... Uh, this, uh, understanding about once we get rid of the Bourne Amendment, does its ghost still linger? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not have that information until we saw Dr. Vladek's testimony. I wasn't aware that the uh, administration was going to recommend repeal of the Bourne Amendment. Mm -hmm. Our recommendation, of course, suggests that that it not only be a repeal, but a clear statement that, uh, that the uh, rate-setting process is solely that of the states, and uh, that presumably uh, any lawsuits would be under the state law and not under the federal law if that were done. And it, and there's no way I guess you could preclude. What would trouble you about that, Ms. Vader, if we did that? I, I would want to think some more about that, but I think my understanding is that the primary problem, is, which is consistent with the testimony that was given, is that uh, there are, um, the language, the statutory language of the Bourne Amendment is, is quite vague, mm -hmm. and that the courts have uh, no standards by which to apply it, and consequently, uh, I, I think quite consistent with what you testified, that, that has been the major source of problems. So I, I, I think that it is uh, throwing something to the courts without any specifications that is the mm -hmm. biggest problem there, not necessarily uh, the federal courts. Um, we have our Medicaid, Medicare growth is growing at 7.2 percent. Our Medicaid growth was not 4.8, it's 5.2 percent. But um, I, I, the confusing thing for you and, 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 and all of us is what's the baseline. And, but, but it is a 5.2 percent growth. Now having said that, uh, you know, I conceded earlier on, as someone who helps set these numbers on the budget committee, um, and I've raised it with my leadership, I've raised it with Mr. Panetta um, as well, and, and uh, uh, his legislative uh, liaison people, that we allowed for a greater growth in Medicare, but not basically that same level in Medicaid. My contention is that the 7.2% growth in Medicare is a, is a very significant growth, your argument would be that Medicaid should be closer to that gross level of getting over the 6%. Um, and where, where I now would respond to you is that we're looking to change the program. We made significant savings in Medicaid care, uh, make significant savings in Medicare without negatively impacting beneficiaries. We don't increase the copayment. We don't increase the deduction. We keep the beneficiary rate at 31.5%, with the taxpayer continuing to pay 68.5%. We have a, a test for the wealthy. The wealthy are going to have to pay more for Medicare Part B. Instead of they're paying 31.5%, they're going to have to pay potentially up to 100% after they, uh, on incomes over 100,000. What we also do, which is something that we did in the private sector, and this is, I'm just trying to illustrate changing the system uh, means a savings. Uh, and what we also do with Medicare is we then provide for uh, a whole host of choice for the beneficiaries, allowing them, though, if they choose to get into managed care or some other private care, and their only inducement to do that is if they get something they don't get now under the traditional Medicare system, 
eye care, dental care, a rebate on the premium or co no copayment. Maybe the Medigap is paid for by, by the managed care people. If they don't like it, they have every month they can get off and get back onto their old fee-for-service system. Um, there we make significant changes. And that's why we're able to keep the growth at 7.2% as opposed to a 10% or 11% growth. Have you had a chance, Ms. Fader, to, to look at Medicare? Are you more focused on Medicaid? No, Mr. Chays, I am familiar with Medicare as okay. well. Are you as trouble with Medicare, or, or is there more trouble with Medicaid? Well, uh, I, I would rather, rather than make a comparison, I would tell you, if you wish, what my concerns are about the Medicare proposal. Okay. Uh, only, and, and I, 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 I'd welcome that. And, uh, well, what I would, I'd, I'll do it briefly and, yeah. and relate them to, to what we're talking about, sure. about what can be expected from structural change. Uh, on the Medicare proposal, uh, the, the savings, according to the not only experts but the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the savings or the slowdown in the, in the rate of growth come not from any kinds of, uh, or not overwhelmingly, from changes in the structure in terms of beneficiary choice. They come from caps that are established in terms of federal payments. Uh, and so it, it, is, it, I think, is not quite right to see it as coming from market efficiencies. It comes from restrictions and from really turning the program from a defined benefit program to uh, a defined contribution program yeah. where the risk is shifted from the federal government to the beneficiaries or to health plans. So no, I, you know, that's no, with all due respect, you're, you're really stretching it. The federal government is going to keep the fee-for-service system. For anyone who wants the fee-for-service system, they get it. We do not scrap that. No, but the, you're, you're quite right. The growth, okay. But the growth in it is capped. Uh, and there are a number of concerns about what yeah. happens to that um, arbitrary cap relative to the cost in the fee-for-service right. system over time, which then, you're quite right, that, the peop that system remains available. The question is whether the rates paid to providers in that system are sufficient to assure access to, to care right. to beneficiaries, which is not dissimilar to the concerns that have been raised in the Medicaid program. Okay. And your comparison in the Medicaid yes. is what? What I, what I wanted to say is that, it, um, is that the issue, again, going back to what we can expect from changes in structure, that, in, that I, I, again, I'm, I'm impressed by the level of agreement. There's agreement on the Bourne Amendment. There's agreement on managed care. There's agreement on the home and community-based care. There's agreement on de delivery flexibilities. The evidence is that, let's look at managed care, that that saves from, provides one-time savings of about 10 to 15 percent, or I think it's 5 to 15 percent, actually, um, of expenditures. Uh, and it is, in terms of our uh, state's experience with managed care and experience in the private sector, it is applicable to the portion of the program that is the, the mothers and children. It, we don't have experience with long-term care and managed care. Uh, so it, well, we're, starting more, to get, we're trying, starting to get experience in Arizona with long-term care being managed. Ar Arizona is, is an exception in which there is some experience, but we could talk more about that. Managed care in general is, uh, and I think that's what the states have wanted to do, is apply it to the women and children portion of their program, which, as we saw, is only 30 percent of the spending. So if we save 15 percent on 30 percent, we're talking slow down. about... Slow down a second. When you talk percent on percent, I, my mind sure, starts to wonder. Sure, sure. We're talking about the managed care generating savings of about, at maximum, 15 percent of expenditures, okay? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to say we're going to apply where we know we have experience and can generate savings and can actually make a managed care system, yeah. devise a system to do it. We're talking about taking 15 percent of roughly 30 percent of the program's yeah, spending. See, you make an assumption that I don't agree with, and that is that it's a one-shot savings. Uh, well, I'm, I'm reporting to you what the literature and the evidence tell us. Mm -hmm. Well, um, would you agree that some literature says one thing and some literature says another? What I would say is that if the we can't agree on that one. We got a problem. Because, the, the, what uh, I would say is that the literature has said that historically, and then in the last couple of years that we have seen a more aggressive negotiating with providers and discounting mm -hmm. that might be sustainable uh, to to some greater extent right. over time. Yeah, thank you. 
But what I'm pointing out is that we don't have experience with managed care for population for, for population with disabilities, nor with the elderly population or on long-term care. Um, virtually, virtually none, not none, you're quite right, but very little. This committee uh, that I've been on for a good number of years oversees HICFA for waste, fraud, and abuse. I have, I came uh, elected thinking that the federal government would do it better than the states. And, and I have evolved to realizing that it doesn't do it better than the states, it does it worse. I, um, I have a, a gigantic question mark. Uh, when I look at Medicaid and Medicare, I see extraordinary waste in the program, extraordinary waste. So I have a level of confidence that um, a system that the private sector gets more involved in has a financial incentive to be involved in and realize a benefit by, by, by trying to get at the waste, fraud, and abuse, that there is a lot in this system to squeeze out. That is simply not cost savings, but is efficiencies. And um, if that's not true, God help our country, because we can't continue to have growth rates of 10 or 12 percent a year. We just simply can't. It is just not sustainable. And my conversations with Leon Panetta and others when he was in Congress was saying, we have to find a way to slow the growth of entitlements. Do either of you gentlemen have a comment? And I'll get to my next question. Well, if I could just say something about, uh, about the drift of the conversation. Uh, it seems to assume, uh, on both parts, uh, that there is a population that will just continue to grow that's eligible. Now, uh, let's assume you don't add new, new wrinkles or new beneficiaries to that po population. What, what makes that sort of a difficult assumption for me to swallow is that if there are certain policy changes at the federal level and certain international changes that will alter the economy, and that population could very well shrink. And, and so in a, I think that the conversation has to be tied to a, this other dimension. Uh, in, if today is where the conversation no, has gone I, before. I, I would it, like to deal with that yeah. issue because we, but it was the point that you had triggered when I began to, right. to, to talk about population growth versus uh, the, the, the co increased cost of a program, I mean mm -hmm. the inflated cost, the inflation cost. Perhaps one of the reasons we had a number of uh, groups added, and uh, the oh. Professor Fetter could answer this, in the 1980s is we had fairly sub substantial growth in some parts of our co country, economically. Okay. Well, let, but let's yeah. focus. One thing we, we'd probably agree on is that the elderly are going to get older and therefore <laughs> be in nursing homes. Well, not so necessarily. Not, uh, they, they're well, certainly going to get older. Let, but. Let's agree on this point, <laughs> though. I mean, and, and, I mean, I realize there are exceptions. So it seems to me your point is more focused on the poor population, the non-working uh, poor, uh, more than, than the nursing home population, which is the elderly. And, and unless you're saying that the elderly are going to have more money, so they're not going to go on Medicaid as soon. They're well, going to be older. That, but, you know. perhaps, uh, perhaps that's one part of it. Um, the other part of it is uh, that, uh, well, I, but let me just add one other, one other wrinkle. OK, and, but I, and then I want to yeah. get to this. I wanna, and I want all three of you panelists to respond. What, what's, so you can get, make that point. I'll okay. listen let's, to let's, let's just deal with this issue. Your point is that if we can get the economy to generate more economic activity, mm. that we would affect the population. Right. But, and all I'm asking is, would you basically acknowledge that the population you're most affecting would be really the 72% the, the, the of the population that, that the grabs about a third of the cost? That's, of the, yeah. Okay. That's, that's very reasonable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Mr. Chairman, one, yes. one thing I think it's somewhat comparable. If you look at SSI versus uh, a AFDC, uh, SSI with the blind, the disabled, and the, and the aged, the federal program, uh, people that become eligible for that program, as far as I know, virtually never fall off the program. Yeah. Only more come in, none ever leave once they're in. The AFDC tends to be up and down, and, and, uh, and we hope going down, perhaps. I think there's a comparable situation <clears throat> with Medicaid, that those elderly who are now in nursing homes, elderly poor, or who are now receiving Medicaid, are probably always going to be in that situation. And to a great extent, the disabled 
uh, will fall into that too. So that there is one group that will can only get larger that will not decrease. It's it's the ch women and children uh, part of it that that can fluctuate, uh, and, and it seems to me that that makes a considerable difference as as uh, federal government and state governments look at this program. We have governors and some legislatures, but a good number of governors who are eager to take on uh, this challenge as a block grant. Now, uh, what's your best take or worst take on their eagerness to do it, Ms. Fader, and then I'll ask the others. Why do I have so many governors saying we uh, can't stand this, this program? I mean, you had Governor Weld basically, uh, well, you had more than Governor Weld. You had, you had, uh, you want to give me the statement that you had, um, you had President Clinton say, quote, we need to get a handle on the Medicaid mandates, otherwise some of us are going to go broke. Um, the accelerated costs of Medicaid, Medicare, and other health programs argue for a new look at health care financing options. And then you have Governor Weld uh, just basically release us from federal nonsense. And so he, he says, so when Washington Democrats characterize our enthusiasm for block grants as naivety, na 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 um, or worse, a perverse desire to begin some race to the basement, they miss the point entirely. If the federal government would just release us from its bureaucracy and nonsense, we'd make these programs better for those they serve and would do it for less money. Uh, and then he basically says it's time for President Clinton to allow the states to give it our best shot. We couldn't do worse than Washington. I'd know we'd do much better, much better. Uh, what's, your, what's your worst or best take on why the states want to do it? Well, as you said, we should be candid, and I think that in all candor. Haven't you been? Uh, candid? Totally, totally <laughs> candid, and I will continue to be so. Uh, be, I think. You may not be right, but you're never in doubt. <laughs> Now, may I say that that, may I say that, that, <laughs> that was said to me one time, so I, I just had to say it to someone else. I, I took it in good spirit, I think. <laughs> you know, I, and I figured since you have such a good sense of humor, I could get away with it. But I, I think that we have a lot of statements by a lot of uh, political actors in the current debate mm -hmm. that reflect a number of varied objectives. Okay, uh, fair and, enough. And I think that if we are... Um, looking at the um, the problems that states are likely to face, um, states are now face, they are looking for flexibility and I, I really think it's important to keep reiterating um, that, that the, on the flexibility and delivery and payment side there is agreement and in terms of the desire to slow the growth, the rate of growth in the Medicaid as well as the Medicare program. There is agreement. Uh, the question is whether that's going to be done in a way that protects the coverage of the population. Okay. Gentlemen? I'm, by the way, I'm just going to ask a few more questions and then we're going to end this uh, uh, hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there's no doubt states are concerned about the, the growth that's occurred in Medicaid. And uh, the, uh, as, as you said, the only question is how, how best to go about curbing that growth. Mr. Beach? Uh, uh, if I could share just one personal experience. I used to work uh, for John Ashcroft when he was governor of the state of Missouri. Missouri. I was on his budget and planning staff. And uh, well before it, it became a, a, a federal issue of note, uh, uh, Governor Ashcroft was closing nursing homes right and left across the state, largely because they were abusing elderly people. He took this as a personal thing, and as you know, he's a very devout fellow. It was politically very Im important to him as well within the state. Uh, so I think in part some of our governors are interested in doing this because they want to show that they can do it. It's, a, it's a, an issue that the public has be, be, before them and they want to demonstrate their ability to do this. But also, we just found a lot of ways within the state government in which we could cut costs if we weren't required to do things a certain way yes. or report a certain way. Um, and uh, it was a continual frustration, a maddening frustration as we ran up against budget constraints that we weren't enabled, we weren't capable of doing those things. So there's a whole inventory, just to close, a whole inventory of, of items that governors, particularly their long-serving and suffering staffs, know that they can do if they could only do it. Um, 
Mr. Cuomo was reported uh, saying in the New York Times a few months ago, he said, um, when we had the chance to fix the system, we didn't take advantage of it, and now it's, uh, I think he might even use the word destroy. Um, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't agree with all of that, but I, it is interesting to me that um, uh, we're, we're finally wrestling with this issue, which I think has been just kind of there for a long time, calling out for, uh, for addressing. And, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, it's kind of sad in one sense that it has taken us so long to get to this point where we're at. And uh, I'm struck by one, one point. In my own mind, I hope we go all the way. Um, if we go 70% of the way or even 50% of the way, it will be a significant progress. Uh, to me, as I look at it, why not go the full distance? Um, but um, this has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, you've added a lot to uh, my knowledge, and um, you've made my day by at least acknowledging that a cut in the uh, growth <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is still an increase. And, um, uh, what I'd like to do now is just submit, we've got some more. First, I want to say uh, uh, that this record, this, the record will be open for three legis three, for a period of time. Is there a three, day we, three days uh, and uh, for any submission of anything you would like uh, to add, uh, anything that uh, um, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle would like to add. And I'm going to submit for the record uh, a number of letters from governors who are eager to get into this program and hope that we get rid of the red tape. And I would allow each of you to just make a closing comment if you'd like. Well, I just would, in 10 seconds, like to say that the growth of this program and its related Medicare program is a constraint on economic growth. And anything we can do to make this a better program that's less costly will aid the economy, which, of course, aids the targeted groups. Thank you. Mr. Barnes? Mr. Chairman, at the very least, I hope the repeal of the Boren Amendment will come out of this I whole think, process. I, I, I think you're, you, you've got a commitment on that. We just have to make sure its ghost doesn't still stay there. Ms. Fader? And Mr. Shays, I would just like to be sure that the entitlement to insurance coverage for vulnerable populations comes out of this process. Okay, and I get the last word. And I'm going to tell you that with all my heart and soul, I believe the states are going to be as responsible, if not more responsible, and responsive to the population that you and I both care deeply about, all of us do. And um, I thank you um, for coming. And I th I'd like to, to thank uh, Kate Hickey and uh, my staff and others on my staff. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. And also the recorders that have been here uh, diligently and uh, uh, have done their job, as they always do, extraordinarily well. And uh, thank you very much. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. It was, it was interesting. Nice to have you up here. Even if you, uh, even if you didn't say anything, I, your presence made me feel like I had to do it. Thank you very much. I don't know if you're on with Trey. I always thought, what? She needs always up there. This program will re-air later here on C-SPAN 2 at 2.15 in the morning. In a few moments, a look at the 1996 election year. But first, a few Saturday programming notes. This Saturday on our companion network, C-SPAN, on America and the Courts, we look at a Supreme Court case concerning whether women may be...